My name is Lieutenant Aldo Rain, and I'm putting together a special team, and I need me eight soldiers. Eight Jewish American soldiers. Now, y'all might have heard rumors about the Armada happening soon. Well, we'll be leaving a little earlier. We're gonna be dropped into France, dressed as civilians. And once we're in enemy territory, as a bushwhacking guerrilla army, we're gonna be doing one thing, and one thing only. Killing Nazis. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I sure as hell didn't come down from the goddamn Smoky Mountains, cross 5,000 miles of water, find my way through half of Sicily, and jump out of a fucking aeroplane to teach the Nazis lessons in humanity. Nazi ain't got no humanity. They're the foot soldiers of a Jew-hating, mass-murdering maniac, and they need to be destroyed. That's why any and every some bitch we find wearing a Nazi uniform, they're gonna die. Do you expect me to talk? Good evening and good night. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of Do You Expect Us to Talk? I'm your host Becca and as always joined by Chris and they and we want our scalps. That's a bingo! <laughs> Bonjourno. <laughs> Grassy. Glad to meet it. <laughs> and what's the name he says like, a cook a cook a cook cook whatever it is. Unpronounceable name. Yeah. Listeners, we are back. Apologies for the brief hiatus, but we are back. Um, so anyway, yes, as you may have guessed, we are reviewing Inglorious Bastards, starring Brad Pitt, Christopher Fox, Diane Kruger, Michael Fassbender, Daniel Brawl, Eli Roth, and Mike Myers, and many more. Written and directed by Quentin Tarantino and released in 2009. Uh, talking of just, just, a, a, just a sort of little epilogue on casting, Winston Churchill in this film was played by Rod Taylor from The Time Machine and The Birds. Oh, of course it is, yes. Mm. Looked very, very different in his old age. Yeah, you wouldn't recognise him, actually. I had to, mm. I sort of like, I accidentally left him off. And I was like, yeah. I, I recognise his voice, even though doing a mm. Churchill impression. And is, I was like, oh. Is, is he solely in it? Is like the character of Winston Churchill solely in it because Hitler's in it? And he had to at least have like... The... Uh, on balance. Yeah. Possibly. It might just been an opportunity to put Tarantino, uh, for Tarantino to put Rod Taylor Rod in Rod Taylor something. in the film. Probably, probably. Mm. Yeah. The legend. Uh, we also get uh, Bond's current squeeze as of the time of recording. Leia Sadu is in this in the opening. I know, show. it's like almost a Bond reunion, almost. And the woman I want to play a Bond girl, Diane Kruger. She'd be amazing. Mm. Well, I'm just thinking we've got an older Bond at the moment, so, you know, age, age appropriate, she'd be like 43 at the time of release, something like that. Yeah. So it would be a bit odd if sort of something's like. Um... In the next film, she, she's like on Daniel Craig's arm, thinking, oh, "Where's Leah Seydoux gone?" I thought. Uh... <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, we're not going to get a film of them just going to Waitrose and shit. Oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> over. Going to Lidl. Yeah. That's if we get I the can... film at all. There's talk of a delay again, and it wouldn't take much for Daniel Craig to walk off. So we'll no. see. Well, that's been delayed till. Well, not being delayed, but there's more talk of a delay. It's just like, oh, bloody hell. We I... can only speculate. Oh dear. Well, it's, he, he, got, um, he got a, a oh director confirmed now, and you got Danny Boyle. So Yeah, yeah I mean, they're, they're only speculating on the delay because um, MGM have not been able to do a uh, distribution deal. Uh, but it's partly because them and Eon are looking to sort of do a one-film deal. And, you but then know, you've got the um, 60th I, anniversary coming up in 2022, so I hope they don't hold it off for that long. Why are they doing a one-film deal? I, I because don't... they're bellends who shouldn't be in the business anymore. <sighs> sorry, having sorry. Met, having met them, I can verify they are lovely people. I'm sure they're lovely people. <laughs> I don't care if they're lovely. We could be waiting five years for a bond. No, film. I know. That's, that's incompetence. No, we've had this discussion is, already. So they need two to years after the last one. Pull their finger out. The next one. 
with a release date that was two years hence. Mm. They didn't even really start getting a script together until fairly recently. They did, they, we still don't know if they've got signed off on a director. If they have, that's getting on for three years after the last film. And now, conveniently, it's like, well, MGM aren't doing a distribution deal. Eon were fucking this up by themselves. Without yeah, they need it. To get so, it, really. Their man, MGM, can sell it. I mean, fuck, anyone would like distribute like, a Bond film. Unless you're offering very, very ridiculous terms. Yeah. Which speaks to your incompetence, not the market. If you if you fail to sell Bond, you're the problem. <laughs> well, it's true, though. I mean, like, you are absolutely right. You know, if it's, it's, it's really... I mean, other than, like, say, Marvel or Star Wars... Yeah, or... it's not the biggest, but it's top three or four. Yeah, well, you, you've got a long-standing fan base. You're always going to yeah. have an audience... Particularly in the UK and Europe, and and I imagine like all over the world, really. So well, it's... the fan base, the fan base is going to die off at this fucking rate. Oh, you know, what, <laughs> ki- ki- kids are going through their entire school careers barely yeah. ever seeing a Bond film. It's 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 almost like the same level as uh, between uh, Blastical and Goldeneye. Won't take much for us to be at that level again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, get it to a studio that whacks these out every couple of years. Definitely. Once a year. Because if you did it, because if you did every two years, right? Yeah. Basically, it, an actor could do like five in effectively eight years, because year zero is the first one. Yeah. Five films in eight years and out. I mean, if you really tried, I mean, you could you could squeeze them like out uh, a few out annually, couldn't you? And then like I'll have a have a bit of a break and then move on. And then I'll have five done within six years. I know. It's you know it's. It's it's really and, the, and, the, and then you release a cut, like, yeah you have a bit of a break as the as the actor you know goes on doing other stuff you know so he doesn't get like typecast as you know rogue spy. Well, Boyle makes other films as well. You can tell we haven't podcasted for a while because all this has been going on since we've last podcasted. So we've come on to do a film we're all really fond of, I think. And all this frustrations come pouring out of us in the first five minutes. <laughs> I, I can't, it, I can't get remember, on with it. I can't remember any news anyway, but. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, all this is coming out about potential delays and all the rest of it. It's speculation. I mean, it might still come out, but even if it comes out on its published date of November 19, four years, they should be ashamed of themselves. You know what happened? You know, the, the script won't be ready, then they'll have to film it, and they'll have to reshoot it, and, and, it'll, and, be and, one massive and it'll, it'll be rushed, script. and it'll be all oh, that'll do. Yeah. That'll probably be it. Should be ashamed of themselves. I think that's how it's going to go, Chris, to be honest. I think you just predicted Bond 20. <laughs> next Bond film yeah because yeah. Dan's not getting any um, please any God, younger. Eon, and, Eon are not are still it, it's not no. the current Eon regime when they get to the 60th anniversary because you'll get some piss poor book or something uh, uh, you know Colonel Sun knows you've had already well and it's just the fact that like I say the 60th anniversary you should think there should be like real it's celebrations special. and home releases and a great film and all the rest of it exactly uh, it, under the current regime there'll be nothing and they'll miss the date there'll be another Skyfall Oh no, not Skyfall, really. Skyfall, Skyfall's not a bad film. No, I think that's, okay. that's, that's it. But what else did what else did they do that year that was any well, good? Precisely, this is it. Anyway, what are we covering tonight? Anyway, so yes, <laughs> Inglorious Bastards, as I said. Yeah, it's only because only because we mentioned Leia Seydoux. Damn you, Leia Seydoux! <laughs> <laughs> I thought like for, she, for, she for was be... quite cool when she made this film. She's what? only in, like one shot or something, really. <laughs> You see a couple of shots. She's one of the. She's one of uh, Shosana's sisters, basically. Mm. Yeah. Oh no, she isn't. She's the family who are under the stairs, actually. But that family that are. No, you know, she, no, she's not under the stairs. She is actually in the. Yeah, yeah, she's when um, is it like the, the farmer's daughter, family, yeah. Something? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh right, yes, right. She's the third or fourth daughter or whatever it is. Oh yes, because he knew her name. That's right. Mm. Yeah. So this is the first Tarantino film uh, since Death Proof. Uh, and the first, yeah, decent, right, and the first, de- first fucking decent one since two thousand and three, in my opinion. I'm uh, inclined that, to agree a little bit. It's not, it's not that long after Death Proof. Death Proof was two thousand and seven. This is two thousand and nine. So if anything, this this came along sort of pretty much ahead of schedule. If anything, um, but there was a little bit of buzz around this film, um, and I'm not quite sure where that buzz came from. I'm not sure if he had it at. Um, if he had it in film festivals or what, but there was buzz by the time this started getting wide release that, like, this is something quite special he's produced. Um, I saw posters and stills from the film, uh, which typically were like Aldo Rain, mm. um, which was a little bit off-putting because 
he's got this kind of underbite. The character pushes his jaw, bottom mm. jaw out, yeah. and it looks awful in a still photo. It's absolutely fine in the film. He's posing, when you, isn't when he? you see it on a poster, you think this is going to be really cartoonish and awful. And it would say something like, Brad Pitt is a bastard. And then the next one would say, Eli Roth is a bastard. bastard and of course, yeah. Eli Roth, brilliant. This is going to be good then. Um, <laughs> was this like uh, the Hostel series? I mean, I, I mean, his profession is film director, and I don't even like watching him doing that. So what he does, <laughs> what, he, what he does as a fucking hobby is, a, is far less interesting to me. Um, so I went in a little bit, uh, just do my first thoughts, I went in a little bit nervy about this, because the last two Tarantino entries haven't been great, in my opinion. Uh, the very last one had been absolutely dreadful. Tarantino also also created his own sort of narrative about directors don't get better as they get older. And he'd arrived in his late 20s as this like, special filmmaker who'd knocked out three really great films by the age of like 33, 34. By the time this comes out, he's now like 46, which isn't old. But I just thought maybe he was a director that almost needed his youth, that, that perhaps he didn't have it anymore. Um, I remember my viewing of this extremely well, and from the first scene it had me. It just had me, from from his musical choice leading into the start of the film, um, which I thought was ex- exceptional. I'm just looking up the name of the track. It is The Green Leaves of Summer. It's, uh, uh, again, very Western uh, influence. It's from the Alamo. Yeah. It's from the Alamo. Um, I did remember that bit, but I couldn't remember the name of it. <laughs> uh, it's from the 1960 um, uh, John Wayne film, The Alamo. Um, which is, as I'm not a great John Wayne fan, but as John Wayne goes, I'm not a big fan of the Alamo. But anyway, um, so he had, he was sort of heading towards his Western face because I know he talked to Ennio Morricone about potentially doing him a, a, store, a score for this. Um, and then we've got, I genuinely be- believe, one of the great opening scenes in cinema. And from then, this film had me, and I, and I walked out absolutely delighted with it. I bought a special edition of the, the, the Blu-ray, the one that's got the apple strudel recipe in it. Ooh. Um, Have you tried so, it? Yeah. Have you ever tried uh, it? Have you made no, it? I, maybe I ought to, actually. Okay. Perhaps we'll do it to celebrate the end of the series <laughs> uh, in a couple of films' time. So, yeah, um, this was... This was and has been and possibly still is my favourite Quentin Tarantino film. My one caveat on that would be I didn't have the greatest of viewings with it this time. And also, as we were supposed to record a little while ago and got delayed, I didn't want to re-watch it. No, but I think that is a sign of it. It's just a, it's a film I can only watch every three or four years. It's not Jackie Brown, which I could throw on any time. But it's a special film and I wouldn't change a frame of it. I think it's absolutely terrific. What about you guys? Becca, you go first. No, as I said, I would be inclined to agree that this is probably Tarantino's best film in a long time. Although I did enjoy Death Proof, it was probably the better of the two between that and Planet Terror. You did, but, uh, um... excuse me, I, I, edi- <laughs> I, I edited that review. You did not like Death Proof. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've no, just... well, no, I, think I, I, I wasn't a fan of it, but I would say if I was comparing the two films, I would prefer that one. Um, but I'm not, not to say I wasn't like a fan of it as such, but I would say for me, if I had to like one of the two, it would be that one. Um, but no, no, I, I think for me this is pretty much um, a returned form, this is what we've been used to, Tarantino sort of pumping out films of quality. Again, he attracts a really good cast. Um, I think it's these sort of times when you've got people like Vassbander and Bart sort of coming to prominence. Um, I think this is one of Vassbander's like earlier sort of big screen roles, shall we say. Obviously he's been on, been known for sort of UK television um, and very, you know, smaller TV dramas. Um, but yeah, I think it's very much a returned form. Um, like. It's kind of like a sort of Western war drama wrapped up in an adventure film, I think, really. So there's lots of different um, generic genre layers to, to peel away there as well. Uh, brilliant performance. It's funny, bleakly funny, unfortunately. Um, great performances all round. Um, again, love the use of like various scores from other films coming in, sort of paying um, homage to classic war movies as well. Um, and just, yeah, return to form generally. My fine. Just I do, I do want to add one point. I did forget to mention, and and if if you agree or want to add to this point, obviously do so, Becca. I have to say, Hans Lander is probably the best Tarantino character from mm. his entire canon. Yeah, she's uh, mentioned and that one last of the great time. performances of his of his canon. So I would add that, Chris. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny. Uh, one of the things I picked up on on uh, the viewing I had weeks ago uh, <laughs> is um, it's how actually he treats the Germans. Uh, he he. 
he doesn't do the stereotypical they're all fucking evil bastards. Um, though they are, they they don't ever excuse that. There's always that side to it. But they, 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 he does represent them as actual real life people, you know, as much as. Yeah, it's it's like you know, down to that 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 scene in the bar where like they were actually all talking about, oh yeah, I'm a father now, and they all seem like like jolly and happy, and and it's just like really sort of human errors and mistakes, and yet yeah, he's like the, the character out of the soldiers who he had the most sympathy for. So, oh, he's a father, and yet he wanted like just machine guns the rest of the room, just on just on like a panic, even kill like the innocent barmaid, which is like oh well. Yeah, you know, it's it's this very very grey area complexity which I really kind of liked about um, how he how he dealt with the characters. Even like with Lance Hando, his character goes to uh, does a, does a thing that you think, oh shit, I oh, didn't expect that. That's interesting, um, but we'll get to it when we talk, talk through the film sequentially. Yeah, the, the Inglorious Bastards has always been a film that he's always had. Um, he was, he was always talked about ever since uh, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown sort of time. I was like, oh, well, it might be his next film. We don't know. Uh, there was talk of, uh, I think Michael Madsen was going to be was gonna be in mind to be casting it. Then he heard, I've heard stuff about Eddie Murphy possibly. And this is like, go back in 1999, 2000. That, uh, even Adam Sandler at some point. So it was always been like, oh, I wonder what Tarantino would do with a war film. So on one hand, on my first viewing, I was a bit disappointed because... For a film called The Inglorious Bastards, it didn't have enough of The Inglorious Bastards in it. It was very much more about um, the uh, Jewish French girl uh, with the cinema, which is by far the best element of the film. Uh, and that's where where the film actually really works. I I think it's also the film that I, I, I thought, actually, Tarantino is a better director than he is, for, than he is a scriptwriter. Uh, just on loan on, on that third opening scene that, that Dave was talking to. I was like, this is what quality filmmaker looks like. This, you know, this, everything about it just felt great. Um, you know, it was, it, it was tense. Uh, it looked fantastic. And it was just, it just, it, it, I want to say spewed just quality. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> saying like a, a lewd word. Chris, but, <laughs> Chris you, a little evo- evocative words yes. you know, about prestige there, Chris. Spewed <laughs> quality. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's... I've always thought this film was a bit of a mess and I think it does hold together better than I thought it did. That thought it did. Um, but I, I, I think ultimately, I think it does hang well together um, I just wish there was a more attention was done with the, with the bastards, really, the, uh, with the actual Brad Pitt and his squad, because it it kind of feels like, well, you're just kind of like part of the film. The film, you're not really adding much. You're not. You're not the film. No, you and it really, and it's and it, I'm not saying they have to be. Like, obviously, I, I mean, I I generally thought, I generally think that. I could have done with like a longer film and maybe just beefed out their bit because there's lots of there's lots of sort of things they think oh like they they big up um, what's the German actor's name I can't Daniel Brühl not Daniel Brühl oh do you mean Stiglitz yes Stiglitz uh, they, they make a big Swiger. thing out of him yeah Till Schweiger thank you yeah um, they make a big thing it's like oh okay and then it, nothing really happens with it I mean. Yeah, because his entrance with Stiglitz and all that, you think this guy's gonna be really cool, and his reveal is cool, but then there's not much after, is there? No, I mean he is a still a cool character, and he is cool in this in the predominantly the scene that he's in. But the problem is you've got Fastbender in that scene, <laughs> so it's like you're just thinking of how great Fastbender is. So, and and this film tells us why Michael Fastbender became a star because it's a little supporting part, and he absolutely owns the screen. He really does. He really does. Again, I mean, and yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, but do do we really need his character in there? Like, I just I was just thinking, of what was the, the actual purpose of it? Like, could not. It shows just... that he's a star. Well, no, but yeah, but it's like could not be I like. Think, a... I think I think th- I think the point is actually to um, give uh, a subplot that that uh, uncovers uh, Bridget von Hammersmark as uh, as a collaborator. As a spy, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's just quite, that's, that's the, but it's quite that, interesting also that, as well. There's a relation to him, obviously playing an English character who 
um, masquerades as a German, but has trouble hiding his accent, obviously because he is like half German, half Irish. That's not um, the, I was going to say that's not the accent my has, but no. he really struggles. No. So half- uh, X Men First Class. He was he was uh, about halfway through the film. Suddenly, you know, I, I was expecting him to sort of say, "Like my Murphys, I'm not bitter." <laughs> <laughs> really Irish from about yeah. halfway through that film. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's you 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 pick up on direction, and we we've got it from the very first scene of the film. I mean, just every role. I mean, we, we'll talk about Christoph Waltz all the way through, but in that scene, he's opposite Dennis Menashe. Or Denis Menashe, apologies for butchering the um, pronunciation. He's turned up in various things. I've seen him in that uh, Ridley Scott Robin Hood film. I saw him yeah. in Assassin's Creed a year or two ago. Um, a, quite a young actor at this point, actually. He was only in his early 30s, but he, he sort of has an older quality to him, hence the sort of father of sort of teenagers and women in their early 20s. But, you know, this guy is genuinely tortured by what happens in that scene, and we'll get to the scene in a minute, but there's plenty of that all the way through, and I love the confidence of Car- uh, whether you think he's bloated as a filmmaker, and I would argue this film isn't particularly. He doesn't ever... He's confident enough to, enough to let the camera linger on actors and let their, their faces reveal the emotion or reveal the performance over the course of a scene. Mm. Um, and that, that takes confidence in what you're doing, but also takes confidence in your casting. And as, as much as um, Tarantino doesn't sort of use scores, um, he does know how to use music. And, he, and the, the David Bowie song, which you'd never think in a million years would work. Cat people. You never think like right, okay, that that would go down well here, mm. and it you know in 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 a film of this that's set in this time period about this subject, and you think, but he somehow made it work, it and it's cool. Yeah, I would and, agree. And and uh, and it goes together with a glorious shot as well. Mm. Uh, but Definitely. yeah. Uh, Josana stood in the wood- window. Yeah. yeah, I mean that you could. Yeah, just, that's amazing. You could just you know frame Some that and sell it. In the whole film. Yeah, you, no, you really could. Shall we discuss this film sequentially, folks? This oh, is just go film. on then. In a sequential fashion. Now, obviously, the first scene of the film, all I thought of with her sprinting away was I just imagined Tom Cruise sprinting past her. <laughs> and, and, and going, you, too, you too, it's the suits, isn't it? You know the bit at the end where she's like running off with, hands, with uh, Lando, like pointing the gun at her. I just imagine Tom Cruise just running past her. Like, <laughs> that's, what meant, that's what I meant. But, sorry, yeah, yeah um, sorry, I thought you were like. Uh, Beautifully saturated uh, sort of film, this. It's got a, a lovely sort of uh, green glow to it, the, the fields we see. Um, the colour scheme generally is beautiful. It is a beautiful film. And, of course, we're, we're sort of on a French farm, aren't we? Yeah, it, I mean, everything about this scene is straight out of a Western. I mean, we should have really known that Tarantino would make, like, a couple of Westerns after this, because... Yeah, exactly. Was it? It's like a Western wrapped up in, like, a war film, wrapped yeah. up in a drama, wrapped up in an adventure, you know, old-fashioned... Um, but what to eventually we're feeling each other out it's all it is almost like a it is almost like a well firstly it's the long sort of vistas and all the rest of mm-hmm. it but also it's got a it's got an air of almost like a, a stood of stood apart at 10 paces kind of thing mm-hmm. while they gently sort of feel each other out it's um it's good stuff though um hans lander who's sort of a colonel in the german ss and i think because it's once upon a time in nazi occupied germany um, and this is obviously back in the chapter format. Uh, this guy, uh, what's he called? Lapidite, I think. Yep. He sure. is at his farm, where it, it's a dairy farm, because obviously Hans Lander's very fond of milk. Hans Lander, an SS colonel, turns up, because he's basically, a, well, he's known as the Jew hunter, but we find out during the course of this scene. He is there to basically account for all the Jewish people in the area. And he heard that the um, Monsieur Lapidite are hiding them underneath the floorboards. Yeah, we we find out like halfway through the scene, it's that kind of thing where we don't know what, what it is till later on, and then it becomes incredibly tense. But yeah, it's one of the most tense scenes in the film. Yeah, and... Christoph was well plays under like, as if in this kind of you never know what he's thinking. You never know whether he's like just being really polite or being a little bit kooky. And then yeah, you just you and, just don't you don't trust him. It's I think one of his most brilliant performances. Yeah, ever. you always get a sense that he just likes fucking with people. 
he, 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 like, he could generally know nothing about him, but he just like... Has oh. he turned up with an open mind or not? Probably not, we gather through the scene, but he's incredibly polite to Lapidite's daughters. Um, you know, kisses them all on the hand, and each one more as more beautiful than the last, and everything else. Uh, funny as well. I mean, that fucking pipe he smokes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's an epic pipe. He's he like, smokes this smoke epic. Pipe. Do you mind this if I smoke really, mine? Yeah, yeah, really elaborate just, pipe. Just a bizarre little thing that all he wants is milk. He wants to drink milk. <laughs> um, the, the fact that he is so polite as well is also at, at odds with, with the violence that comes later. He, he just really likes dairy, you know. Yeah. Is it clearly not lactose intolerant? So that's quite good. <laughs> well, I think it's also the fact that he's quite a disciplined soldier. He's, he's probably oh, not God. a drinker full stop. He's on duty. We do get the impression over time he takes the job very seriously. But it's just this long conversation with uh, Lapidite. And Lapidite is incredibly stoic as well in that he's not giving much away, but you can tell he's a little troubled. And I can't even remember what they talk about now because it's been a couple of weeks myself since I saw yeah. this film. They talk about all sorts, like the nature of foxes and things like that, as I recall. Well, yeah, he, he basically sort of like compares Jews to like rats, and you think like, yeah, rats, but, you, yeah, but you wouldn't compare like a rat to like a squirrel, even though they kind of just of the same. Even exactly. though what they're the same, and yeah, they're they're very similar. One's got a tail, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I've got it. Um, but. Yeah, you know, he's like you, you. Always have this, obviously, be, because it's the Nazis anyway. You, you're always going to have this kind of. Whenever they come knocking, people are kind of like, always look a little bit on it, you know, on their best behaviour. So you don't really know whether like there's anything to it or or not yeah. at first. I think he's aware. He's aware of the family that are missing, and actually, we were mistaken. Just looking up the cast list here, uh, Shoshana is a member of that family. She is not Lapidite's daughter. Um, so they are under. It turns out they're under the floorboards, and he has to silently. Uh, and of course, they switch between language. They switch between English mm. and French. French. And German, yeah. I don't know if there's any German in this scene. I don't Not think there scene, is. No, I don't think. Um, this film is only thirty percent in the English language, and you know, I left not. I left having seen it, not really aware of that. Fun fact, folks. It drew it drew me in to such a degree. I still thought it was overwhelmingly English. But no, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, it's like French, German, English. It's a um, small minority English system. Italian. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, really quality Italian. We'll get yes. to that. Yes, well, yeah, I've got a fun fact about that later on. Okay. And, um, it, and it's actually a different voice for Tarantino as well, because, you know, Tarantino's often accused of, like, writing, like, the same usual dialogue that he would say, he would actually say. Here it yeah. actually feels when like actual it characters. Wrong, it sounds like him. Yeah. No one in this film really sounds like him, even, no, a, even translated. Yeah. yeah, in terms of like the characters, I think because I think probably oh god, um, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. I, I know that sounds really, really cheesy, and obviously Kill Bill as well. Like the most strongly written characters as well. As I say, they all have their own voice rather than just Tarantino. You know. Yeah, no, I can't disagree. Uh, but obviously, uh, they pointed out that they're under the floorboards and they're sw- switching between languages, not to let on. Mm. I think they went. I think they may have gone to German actually there because. Do this family speak German? No, they don't. Okay, well, I'll swap, switch to that. And they, the soldiers are called in. And he's very politely saying goodbye like he's on his way. And, of course, they fire through the floorboards, absolutely destroying this guy's floor, killing the family except for Shosana, who comes sprinting across the field with Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he, he, he sees it almost like a bit of a challenge, doesn't he? You know, Shoshana, he shouts after her after he fires and misses. I don't think he even fires. He just kind no. of like. I think by the time no, I think by the time he gets her in in his sort of crosshairs, she's too far away. Yeah, I think that's it because she's got she must have particularly gay thoughts to run at that speed. <laughs> <laughs> she's just very very fast. Yeah, that's, what, a, that's it's, what all the trained athletes do. <laughs> all, all those uh, trained sprinters and runners. All, that the old all, 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 that's a secret to how they run fast. It's yeah. they have gay thoughts and they just yeah. <laughs> Well, they're just thinking of Tom Cruise and channeling that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you know, Tom Cruise... He's only got little legs, you see. It doesn't take him long. I think, I, I think I, Tom I, Cruise and gay thoughts go hand in hand, quite frankly. So. I don't... I Honestly, we can't do this scene justice, though, because you can describe what happens in it and what happens. Uh, an SS colonel goes in to see a French guy he thinks are, is hiding some Jews under his uh, floorboards, chats to him quite amiably for a few minutes, make, then makes it very clear he knows what's going on, 
asks him to point, they switch between languages to keep the family under the floorboards off the scent, they kill them with the exception of one woman who gets away. That sounds like an interesting scene, it doesn't sound like a transcendent scene, it is. This film arrives with a bang, it's an incredible scene, and we know, I don't know whether I'd seen Christoph Waltz in anything before this, mm. but I think at the end of the scene I was thinking this this could be awards worthy, this performance. It's like he... He just sort of like it's it's like the saying that that it's like a, he's breaking in with his mind like nothing in a dialogue lets on to anything or up to the point where he just like flat out says you're hiding members of uh of well, I don't know I forget the line of dialogue but you're you're hi- you're hiding members of the family you know uh of the state are you not and it's like uh yes yes you completely broken me even though he's actually not let on or in or really pressed him hard on it at, at all. But he's just sort of like made him so uncomfortable that he just like fucking I know, knows. And it, it could even be a bluff, but Hans Lander's reputation precedes him, uh, and it's sort of well, what, what, what I, really I always, like. What really well, like is it's like well, I'm I'm, I'm assuming since uh, they're not, I don't hear any movement that they uh, don't speak English. Am I correct? But the fact is, Le Petit doesn't know that Hans Lander knows this for certain, and there isn't any proof unless they pull up the floorboards. So it could be a bluff, but obviously. Hans Lander is known as the Jew Hunter, which is probably a reputation he spread himself. Mm-hmm. So actually, actually, he's kind of balahooed his own his own reputation. That's gone. That sort of precedes him now, and all he needs to do is calmly go in and talk to people because fuck me, it's Hans Lander. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. We briefly see Shosanna as she does run past, effectively run past the camera. Uh, we don't get a good look at her. Obviously, we later find out he didn't either. Um, and that's it. We move forward three years. Again, yeah, we like to kind of jump forward in time, in space and time, don't we, really? Well, yeah, we start straight with um, Brad Pitt doing his um, scalp speech. Oh, all God, I, all I want to say on this is I was just relieved because Chris said during his opening thoughts that, you know, I don't want to paraphrase him, but, you know, almost there wasn't enough of the bastards in this. I, I was relieved on first viewing that they were minimised only because going off the poster campaign and teaser trailers and, and, and actual full trailers, a little bit of them made them come off as like cartoonish with this pushed out, you know, <laughs> jaw and everything else and i thought brad pitt was going to be a problem in this film as it turned out he's really good and really funny um it is a bit one note but it's what a good note it's great um so i was just relieved actually when i saw the scene play out naturally beyond just i want my hundred nazi scalps yeah i really really enjoyed this i think i don't know whether it's um whether it's just Tarantino just couldn't really get anyone but I, you know, there's only real recognisable face is Brad Pitt in in amongst the ba- bastards. Uh, the only one, I, the only other one I can think of that I knew was B.J. Novak, who was mainly known from the American version mm. of The Office. Yeah, he was kind of the intern in the American version of The Office. Mm. Which is uh, worth checking out if anybody out there is. It's really good. It's out. really. Good. It I mean, it, it's uh, worldwide. People listening to this will know this over the British one, but obviously. Mm. A lot of Brits will just go, well, I'm not watching some American remake. It's good. What? Ricky Gervais? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it has gone a little bit longer than, than it, IP. Yeah, but... like, like all American shows, mm. they ran it fucking grand. But but it was really good for a period of time. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, don't know, I don't know any of the bastards with the exception of Eli Roth and BJ Novak. Yeah, and it, just, it was just like um, you, none of them had any sort of... You, 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 Instantly, you're just like, I just don't give a shit about any of them because none oh, of them really have any... Changeable. It doesn't yeah. matter. But then really, through the film, Stiglitz, we know what happens to Stiglitz, but when we get to the end of the film, we're with the three we know. The three I've just named are the three we're with. Mm. Oh, no, that's not true, is it? It's not... Oh, BJ Novak is because he's captured with him, yeah. Yeah. There is another one who's actually um, with, with Eli Roth, but we'll get on to that. The scene's pretty decent. Um... This is just basically they go round up just capturing sort of Nazi strongholds and either killing or branding Nazis. Yeah, they always uh, leave one alive and then do the whole speech and then you know brand, you know 
what are you going to do with your uniform when you finish? Yeah, and then before carving a uh, swastika mercy. on the forehead. Because they want mercy, they normally say they'll, they're will they going to burn it and leave this awful life behind. And of course, that's the wrong answer. Because, no, but the world needs to know what you were, so he carves, they carve that, that into their head. The actual scalpings and that bit, the only bit in the film where I was a bit like, ooh, about... <laughs> um, it's quite a long scene. It's a really good scene, though. They have captured a couple of Germans, and basically, Eli Ross char- character Donny Donowitz uh, basically smashes their heads in if they yeah. want to give them what they want. What they yeah. want to. And it's again, this is kind of like the odd thing that I'll be treating Nazis. And normally, just like yeah, fucking just kill Nazis. But here, you kind of have a little bit of admiration for this one. He's like, no, I'm a soldier. I'm going to take this one. I'm not going to. Yeah, and obviously, most of the sort of heinous uh, acts of violence in this film are delivered on Nazis because yeah. they've all been caught. We don't see them in the midst of whatever it is they do. The only killing we really see from Nazis is um, is dramatised in Nation's Pride, which we'll get to later. Um, but we've oh, been introduced to the bastards. One of the th- so. uh, Yeah. I suppose, I mean, really, when you were talking about the naming of the film, I was thinking, you've you kind of got a point. I mean, you could have almost called it Nation's Pride, I suppose, because that's like the film within a film. But, yeah. also, but also, Melanie is you know, na- her nation's pride in terms of fighting back and all the rest of it. Having said that, though, uh, the Inglorious Bastards effectively create an alternate history. And we'll get onto that later, because uh, I do wonder if that's going to carry on to his uh, Manson family film. In the, in the, the, it, it, Twenty Tarantino's universe is subtly different. We'll get onto it later. When, when we get to the demise of Hitler later in the film, We'll talk a little bit about what Tarantino had to say about that at the time, but it does effectively create an alternate history. Yeah, the, the, the bastards themselves are kind of like the uh, like an answer to the Nazis because the Nazis, you know, did horrible things. And they're like, right, well, we're going to give them back tenfold, and it's like, mm. and it does, act, and I think it Get does, it, well, it does act, actually ask some quite questions like, well, is this? Right, what does this do to us? You know, it's... Well, the scalpings are not necessary, are they? Yeah. that's just that's just taking your little trinket mm. from battle. Um, but it, it is a good scene. And obviously we'd see... Do we see Hitler next with the guy they leave? Actually? Nine, 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's like he's like sort of... Tell, it's, it, it's interlaid, really, because he's, he's kind of like telling the story of why he was left, was left alive. So we've been introduced to the bastards, and then we're back, I think, to Shosanna again. Who's now going under the name Emmanuel something? Emmanuel making Emmanuel. Er- making, making erotic French movies no. <laughs> with George <laughs> Lee. <laughs> um, she's running a cinema somewhere in France. I'm assuming. Where? Oh, it's Paris, yeah. isn't it? It's not. Yeah. Okay. Um, some she's running some a... Frenchy town. I don't know. No, I, I wasn't aware. I don't think I was aware it was Paris actually, because the whole point was they they moved because of. Uh, Daniel Brühl's character, uh, because of his infatuation with her, they end up getting the premiere there. Mm. And I thought the whole point was it was somewhere smaller, as opposed to like anything like sort of um, Frederick Zoller. That's it. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't central Paris, but obviously it is. She's uh, yeah. She's running a, pa- a cinema in Paris under an assumed name. Uh, I think that sort of come came to her through sort of relatives, effectively, and she meets sort of one of the local German soldiers who is lauded for basically having been holed up in a bell tower for uh, three days, something like that, and killing dozens if not hundreds of people from that vantage point. Um, and they've made basically a Nazi propaganda film off that, we find out, in a, in a while. But he's definitely got a bit of an infatuation with Shosana. Yeah, he has a little bit of a crush on, doesn't he? A little bit. A little bit. He's quite close to walking around on, uh, on parade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, very, very much so. Um, He's quite charming in this, though. It, at first, anyway. At, f- at first, obviously, obviously not, 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 not so not much say- near the end when he gets like just ridiculously frustrated. And I think so, there was some of that towards the end of the film, sorry to leap around here a bit, no. but I think some of that near the end of the film is the fact that He's just effectively had his ego fanned. Firstly, he's moved the premiere of this film mm. to this small cinema. Mistakenly, he thinks that's almost a coup for the cinema. So it, in his mind, he's done this woman a favour 
Yeah. Uh, why? But why would she want to celebrate Nazis who killed their family? I think, secondly, he's just had an evening of having his ego fanned. All of the German high command being there, you know, them showing this film where he's an absolute hero. Well, I think it's more she, than an evening. She, it's it's and, been and like... She, and she refuses to appreciate him. And I think he just he just finally snaps. That, yeah. Like... I think it's been more than an evening, though, because it's like, obviously, he's been, like, had his, had his ass kiss ever since. Then. Oh, all the way up And I think that at that point, he's just, like, he yeah. just feels like this entitlement's just been, like... It's been building in him, but it yeah. really snaps on the evening because they've got all of the German high command there kissing his ass, mm. and the one thing he's interested in isn't interested in him. Um, but it, it, she's got a she's got a projectionist who works in the cinema that's clearly her lover anyway. A guy called Marcel. Um, where do we go next? Do we go to the whole? Do we go to Fastbender's first scene, or do we go to the Apple Strudel scene? No, I, I've got a feeling. Um, no, she's at the she's at the cinema and she's she's doing something with. With the <laughs> yeah, being very accurate, she's doing something with the signs and. <laughs> oh yeah, the first yeah, we see her, she's yeah, changing she's the doing, songs. Yeah, changing yeah. The and she yeah. meets um, uh, Daniel Brawl at like a, at a bar, or, like pub type place. And he's like... being, he's, tr- he's just trying to be like mm. friendly and a bit charming and a bit playful. Yeah. And of course, he knows nothing of her background, but it's. It, it, he, I think he genuinely thinks she's going to like go for this. Um, and I suppose when you're an occupying force, that's kind of unlikely anyway, even without her background. I think it's, I think it's depend. I think it, uh, it's difficult to say, especially it's a film as well. I think um, some people might be like, yeah, they're okay. Maybe he just doesn't realise because everyone's just kissing his ass. It's like you know, we just you don't know whether they actually. French actually mind that, or some some would be hostile, but they would be clearly be hostile. I don't, I don't know, but it's I think it's obviously it's just it's just not picking up, or he's just seen too many love hearts surrounding that he's just blind to everything else. Um, he doesn't seem to really recognise in the first few scenes her inherent coldness towards him. Yeah, he's just like oh, she's it, playing hard to get. Yeah, <laughs> I think that, that's all he thinks it is. Or it's like uh, oh, oh, no, it's like no, I know I really like her. I'm going to try and pursue this. I'm going to now, really I'm not, try. I'm not quite sure how these scenes are ordered now because, it, like, it's been a couple of weeks. But in one thread, you've got a, a senior British uh, officer played by Mike Myers who is calling in um, Michael Fassbender, who's a, an expert on German film and can also speak German fluently to get involved in a mission. I need to ask questions about that mission in a minute because I'm not really quite sure what it is. Um, Operation Blow Up the Basket. Sorry. Operation Blow Up the Basket. What is? Yeah. What is it? Michael Fassbender's trying to do. What have they tasked him with do? They seem to hire him because he's a German film expert. Yeah, he's, he's a film critic, isn't he? Um, so I think what he's going to do is he's just going to sort of place himself um, within. Obviously, all, all the high-ranking Nazis are going to attend this. Is film he? Here. Is, so he's meant to. He's meant to go right. So he's meant to be the one who goes with her. He goes undercover. Yeah. Right. Okay, I've got it. So the bastards effectively partner up with her to get into the premiere, but that would have been him. Yeah. So they're effectively the, bast- the bastards are the American solution here, and he was the British solution to this problem. Effectively, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, okay. he, that was part of the plan anyway, because he he had cover, so he could, you know, walk, walk in as well. You know, because like he, he would speak go with speak German and look the part and whatever. Okay. And if he's asked anything about cinema and German cinema, he can talk on it a bit. Yeah. Although he says, obviously, of course, I haven't seen anything for four years or whatever it is, or since the war started. And it's like, yeah, of course, that would be the case. Okay, so that th- plot is put, put into practice. At the same time, Daniel Brühl, I keep calling him Daniel Brühl, Frederick Zoller is talking to his superiors about getting the nation's pride premiere in Shoshana's cinema hmm. and she's brought to meet I don't think she knows Hans Lander's going to be there does she no she's actually he's actually meeting with Goebbels and Sophie Fatal. <laughs> Sophie Fatal yeah Sophie Fatal of course yeah um, so I think they've just got to check her out so that's why she's taken there but again yeah. Zolo almost like thinks 
she should be honoured. He, he almost looks proud to introduce her and all this kind of stuff. Well, and she's really uncomfortable. But of course, then Hans Lander's there because Hans Lander well, the, is at effectively first, at this stage. It, sorry, go on. Well, at first, she's like taken there thinking, fuck, they've come, they found me out. And it's kind of really mm-hmm. unsure of like what's happening. And she goes goes to this place. It's like, oh, well, there's all this here. And they talk about the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the films to the cinema. And she's like, oh, okay. And she's like, looking really awkward, just kind of, like, wanting to just be polite and just get the fuck out of there. And that's when, like, Lander just suddenly, like, shows up and it's like... And you just feel the whole atmosphere just go, like... <gasps> but it, it, it's it's almost like... It, it could almost be an interactive ex- experience because if you were in a cinema, you could autom- also... You could almost imagine, like, a 4D cinema would, like, have a strange kind of smell mm. <laughs> emerge from left to right in the screening because he appears... And the whole feel of the frame changes before you're yeah. even quite aware it's him, um, because he's effectively running security for for wherever that premiere is going to be held. So he needs to question her because he's in charge of keeping the German high command safe. Isn't that other German officer that's in, that's later in the bar? Um, he's there as well, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's like, yeah, he's, yeah. he's like questioning. I need to. Uh, I need to. I need to that, before, that, isn't he? He's I like need kind to of... look that your guy up because I, again, I've I've seen him in something else. Um, do you recognise him? I do, but I couldn't honestly tell Quick, you. Where from? Quick, look up IMDb dot com. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I, d- but yeah. Anyway, so um, I will look him up as uh, as we're chatting. But yeah. Um, so he's there as well, and this is a really, really, really tense scene. And it's the second one in the film. We're like half an hour in, or whatever it is by this yeah. point. And we've it's already had two scenes of people just sat opposite each other and our ass gripping the fucking seat watching it. Mm. <laughs> it's just, yeah, the, the, the dialogue and performance is so, it's on point in this film. Like every scene, like, it's, it's quite a, it's, it's a long film, but I don't find any, it drags at any point. And what, what, of course, again, it follows on from the fact that we don't know what Hans Lander thinks. Does he know? You know, he might know, or is he kind of like, or is he kind of got a suspicion? He might, right? He might be suspicious, or is he just enjoying his strudel? We don't fucking know. He's really enjoying that strudel. <laughs> I mean, yeah. funny enough, that was like the direction that he he was uh, given because he was uh, uh, Waltz was uh, kind of like. Asking him like, well, you know, do you want me to? How do you want to play? It? Am I suspicious or, or or what? And he's like, and Tommy Two just basically said, just, at just focus on the strudel. That's all you. That's all. That's the thing that you care about is. And you know, the we know we know Tarantino has got a thing for feet, as we see later in this film. Yeah. Has he got a thing for certain foods as well? I think because we can. We, he's quite. This is this strudel is quite lovingly shot. Hmm. I think he does. I, I remember him talking about food um, specifically on on that, and I think he there is. I think he, he is. Is there something about like? Uh, I don't think it's actually like like his thing with feet, where he just loves food. He's just like, oh, yeah. Uh. yeah I don't think it's sexual, but I mean, he but, really yeah. shoots. I mean, in the next film, and we'll talk about it more when we next week. Um, he, he pours himself like a, a beer, and mm-hmm. we get quite a loving shot of that as well. And, he does like his sort of cutaway and insert shots like that. He yeah. does, and, and, that, and that burger does Edgar look good Wright in Paul Fiction. Well, he, uh, Edgar Wright's a bit like that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I know it's um, it, it's interesting. <laughs> also, the bit where he just like at the end, we just like casually just puts his cig out on the fucking creamer. That just yeah. kind of grossed me out a little bit. It's like, ugh. Yeah. So basically, that what we've got set up now is the, the we've met the bastards they're going to be effectively the american plot that, that comes in later almost as a as a contingency we've had the british plot set up which is basically to get michael fassbender's character in archie to uh, uh go with bridget von hammersmark who's a film star to the um to the premiere so that's uh diane kruger's character can, can i just ask like um what do we think of mike myers because I Ridiculous. think Ridiculous. I... It's the one bum note in the film. I don't like it. Yeah. It's a bit, I... it's a bit kind of like token I don't want to say like token like token Michael Myers role, actually get you know, get him to do his typical British accent, shove some prosthetics on his I... face. 
It doesn't no, belong I in the film. It's too cartoonish. It it's, it's nice to see him because you're not seeing him on screen for a while. You could um, have got any other British actor. It's like, yeah. well, why get? It's only because he's Austin Powers. It's like, well, exactly, and he can do an accent. with like they could have cast. It could have cast a British actor. You could have cast any actor in middle age. You could have put like Tim Pickett Smith there, and it would have been fine. I, yeah, that would have been perfect, really. Um, I I didn't like Colin this. Firth, or maybe Colin Firth is he is now. Colin maybe. Firth. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about an actor actor in his fifties. Hugh Grant, <laughs> even fuck it up. Yeah, just go Hugh Grant. Anything, but it really stood out on first view, and it's the only thing that did. And the scene was very short. I thought there was a bit of Tarantino showing off what he knew about German cinema in the scene, but it gets it gets us from point A to point B fine. Yeah. And there's something about Michael Fassbender's walk. We get him in wide shots in this, and I just immediately thought that's a film star. Mm. Yeah, because um, like yeah. I, I remember thinking, because we most things come through the prism of sort of James Bond with us. I remember watching him in this film and thinking there's potential James Bond there. His time's been and gone now, but I did think that at the time. I immediately looked up his age to think, well, how old would he be when Daniel Craig might go? Mm. So assuming Craig does 10 years, which has obviously turned out to be a bit more than that. Okay, well, that would mean he could come into the role in his late 30s or early 40s, but he's missed the boat now. But um, It would have been nice to see him in the role. Obviously, we saw a little bit of that in X-Men. X-Men First Class in the Argentinian bar, yeah. That was very Channeling. Bond. Um, Channeling that was bond. Very, that was very 60s Bond as well. It was very, very um, much Connery Bond of mm. you. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't like Mike Myers in this. But it, it wasn't ever, you know, ruinous. It was okay. I was no. just, it's just a bit I was random just like, to that's see a little bit, That's a little bit too cartoonish. But it, okay, it, it's one scene and out, so it doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in and no. out. I mean, it's if him he, again. If so. he come back for some little funny reprise later, like you know, he gets a phone call while he's in bed with some, you know, his wife. <laughs> uh, the or, you know, he, you know, some really silly domestic setup. Like where he's maybe he's, he's, the, he's the British answer. <laughs> Well, if, if if they'd done a few general Melchit type scenes with yeah, him, that, you know, like they wake him up and he's got his tash in a little yeah. fucking, yeah. you know, <laughs> darling? Net, darling. you know, that sort of thing. Um, they didn't do too much with it, so it was okay. It was all right. Um, so those those are the main plots in in um, train. There is going to be a at least some of the German high command. At uh, Shoshana's restaurant, uh, restaurant or cinema, on a certain night to show this film *Nation's Pride*, the lead and ins- the inspiration and lead in that the events were his, but he's filmed a recreation of it. Is in love with Shoshana, or certainly infatuated with her. In love would be taken a bit far, probably. We think Goebbels is going to be there. We don't at this point know any more than that. We've met the bastards who are fairly unscrupulous in you know there's no geneva war convention at this stage but they yeah. would they do what they want they, yeah they um, all hate nazis to like a, a degree yeah we've well they're largely jewish mm. i mean they have deliberately cast relatively i mean it, it, eli roth bj novak they're, they're jewish men in real life um so you've got or at least i believe they are you've got bridget van the bridget von hammersmark who's basically a famous film actress who's going to be at this event We've got Michael Fassbender, who's a, basically a British German film critic, who's going to be at this. This who is now working to get to this event, and we don't know what Hans Lander knows because the opening scene of the film, he was trying to kill Shoshana, but how much of us he saw of her, I don't know. So in thirty-five, forty minutes, or whatever it is, that's quite masterfully set up the whole film. And then we go to um, the the setup where they're going to meet the the German film star, uh, our, our our choice for Bond girl, uh, Diane Kruger. Choice for our Bond girl. Well, we've got an older Bond. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you still yeah, could so do it. Cost a... Well, she yeah, could do it anyway. Make... But but the point is, yeah, I, people have been talking about Lily James recently, and she's far too young to be. Oh put fucking hell! Really? Yeah. yeah. Really? yeah. yeah. Been There's been talking of Lily James. She's far too young to be put <sighs> alongside Daniel months. Craig. Yeah. In look as much as anything else, because I mean, Eva Green was only 26 when she played Vesper, but she had a timeless quality to her that Lily Lily James doesn't have. Lily James looks like. Lily James, if anything, looks early twenties, although she's not; she's late twenties. And also, nothing against Lily James, but she does not strike me as a Bond girl. Well, me neither, but she certainly shouldn't be put up against. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I if, agree. It, I, know, I would have to say that if, if they were to re- obviously not with Daniel Craig, but if they were to re- reboot with a younger actor, then I think maybe then four or five years 
down the line even. Um, yeah, not right now. Um, it's good I still to think she's rolls up the outside of Downton Abbey, but perhaps not just yet. Mm. But as it, you know, as a when, I still think she has a lot of potential to show. So, who knows? But some people you just look at and go, yeah, that's not going to work, and she's one of yeah. them, particularly next to Daniel Craig. No, perhaps you, if they need, the you need a, I, I, they need to cast a woman a little older. Okay, uh, no. <laughs> and, it's, it's and to be honest. I was actually surprised by this because my only uh, knowledge of Diane Kruger was in the uh, natural uh, natural treasure films. I've I'd hardly seen any of her, but actually, she did. Uh, I've seen everything. Um, <laughs> she, have. she acted alongside Brad Pitt in Troy. She was Helen of Troy. Shit, yeah, as well. So she, that's uh, what I so first her... saw. Her and, and of course, because she was this sort of almost unattainable goal in that film, because Helen of Troy, everyone understands what the cultural reference of that is. And if you don't look it up, um, anyone listening, but she's very, she doesn't talk a lot in that film, as I recall. And she's kind of bland and as attractive as Diane Kruger was, I, I, I couldn't, that's an impossible role to cast because Helen of Troy is the beauty that started a fucking 10 year war. Mm. So, I mean, you, you you almost can't cast that. It's more beautiful than you can imagine or actually exists in a person. Yeah. But it was always so far so bland based on that. She did that. She, Diane Kruger was born the same year as me, <clears throat> 1976. So she was she was probably about 27 filming that, 28 when it came out. Um, and I didn't see her in anything else for years, I've never bothered with the National Treasure films. They may be great. I've never bothered. No, they're not. So I, I hadn't seen. Well, yeah, just, I just look at the poster with Nick Cage on it and I go, no. no. Um, uh, you know, but not to knock anyone who likes them because I haven't seen them, so I can't slag them off. Um, so I think this was literally the second thing I'd ever saw her in. And looking through her film filmography now, I've hardly seen her in anything since. So. For an actress I've known for the best part of 15 years, could instantly picture when you mention her name, and I imagine as like a busy working actress. When I go to look, I've hardly seen her in anything. I, I imagine she's probably worked in a um, lot more foreign yeah. films, like that sort of more German type films, anyway. Um, but yeah, no, my my knowledge of her was like. I just say so far so bland, and I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm not expecting much from her, and uh, she's really good in this. She took me by surprise because, like I say, she played Helen of Troy, which is not it's 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 a it's an archetype, it's a it's a cliche, it's mm. not it's not a character, and there's not much you can do with it. And the film Troy was crap anyway, and I, I did um, I did the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, at A level, so I, I knew those works fairly well, and and the Iliad is by far the stronger of the two. Um, it's almost unfilmable anyway, but Troy got nowhere near. I had kind of a version of it in my head that I always wanted to see as a film. And, have have and you that seen that uh, BBC series? That, no. That's out. No. All right. Just, just wondering. I've I'm not, not, not seen it. I rarely watch TV, so I don't think yeah. I was even aware of it. But Brad Pitt was, was miscasting for it, and just everyone was miscasting for it, and, and, and the key parts of the work and, and the themes that they got across, and just they got every fucking thing wrong. Um, so anyway, but the point is, she was really bland, and she turned up in this, and I was like, "Oh, it's that woman from Troy." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, Diane Kruger. Yeah, I don't think I've seen her in anything since. All right, okay. And she's actually like a real character in this, and really, really, really good. Yeah, really charming. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. She's in in the in the context of this film. She's a film star. Hmm. So and she plays that. She plays a real character, a, a real person, who happens to have film star magnetism as well, but not, but not in this film. In the world of the film, if you see what I mean, she's. Yeah. she's it's not Diane Kruger's a film star. It's Bridget von Hammersmark is. Yeah, and and, and she's like playing like sort of the very popular one, always like friendly to everyone and kind of like everyone's friend and she, you kind of get the sense that she is like really highly regarded in, in, in Germany and they sort of like and she kind of keeps that up quite well she's actually um it, it's almost like the sexual politics of the film were a little bit ahead of their time in that 
there's no sort of I know it's a few years before this and King Kong does get referenced in this film we'll talk about that in a bit but um, it, it's no Fay Ray sort of uh, damsel screaming mm. she actually comes across as quite like a respected member of the sort of film community rather than a woman circa 1940 politics isn't she sort of uh, sold as like the, the biggest star yes yeah. So there's probably that element of like she she's the one who sells, um, sells tickets so everyone goes to see that see the films that she's in. So it's like kind of it would be along those lines. Won't it? She's the, she's the biggest star. She's like she, well, she's... the other thing is if you if you think of her age, hmm. if she's playing her age here, like I say, born in seventy six. This is a nineteen. This is a two thousand and nine hmm. film. Uh once upon a time, Hollywood would have skewed very young. I mean, we talked about it in the Bond series. They they used to get to a certain age and retire for kids, didn't they? Mm. You know, um, Diana, D- Daniela Bianchi, um, uh, what's she called? Um, the golden girl herself, Shirley Eaton. Um, lots of them actually worked until their late, late 20s. And then their filmography stops entirely. She is now 33. Uh, I think in the world of this film, unlike my generation where we're just possibly maybe starting to think about becoming adults by that point, <laughs> I think actually she will have been a veteran. So she will, she'll be like a legendary mm. uh, member of Hollywood by this stage. Yeah. I got the impression she was probably a bit older, maybe like mid thirties. Um, not, not that she looked it, but it's, uh, it's just that sort of, that el- that elegance, that sort of like, yeah, I've been around, I'm that well established. Uh, She's known everywhere, and yeah. her name opens doors. So if she wants to go to this um, premiere, you know, they- they'd be honoured to have her there, and she would grace the premiere as well. She would add a certain cachet to it. We got mm. Bridget Van von Hammersmark to come to this. Yeah. Um, I-, I think she's terrific in this film, and she's playing, although she looks like her age. She looks the age she looks now, if you know what I mean. She's got this kind of timeless quality, and she plays like a. It, she plays. Um, she's in her early thirties, mm. and she plays a lot older in its way. So she does have this sort of timeless quality about her, though. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think Diane Kruger will be a natural beauty right into old age. I was just looking at her filmography, and I totally forgot that she was in like the US remake of The Bridge a few years ago. No, it's a wider between... version. No, obviously, track down the original Nordic version because it is the best. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't bother because obviously we had the sort of English French remake of <coughs> the tunnel, which is a bit rubbish. But I would, um, yeah, I didn't even bother to track down the. Um, so a different way of transverse, you know. tra- traversing water then. The Scandinavians yes, went the with bridge, a bridge; we went with a tunnel. As a bridge. Yeah, we we go with the with the ch- the Channel Tunnel, um, and the US obviously is straddling the um, Texas Chihuahua border, but I, n- I never saw it unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd suddenly thought, oh, you know, see what she's not. I've seen, I think I've seen the first National Treasure movie. Um, let's have a look. Oh, she's made some international films. Um, but yeah, I, I can't. I don't know. Have I seen that? I don't know. Probably, I don't know. maybe. Well, she's really, really good in it. So we've got, we've basically yeah, got, the, we've excellent. got, we've got the plot set up now. Where do we go from there? Do we go straight to the bar scene? Well, yeah, we are basically at the, at the bar. We have like a fast this film whips by for quite a long film. It kind of whips by. <laughs> we, it, it does. It, it's quite tight actually. It it, it it does. To be fair, it does like it yeah. does pass the time quite well. But yeah, we had the first established bit with Fassbender and Brad Pitt basically sort of uh, debating. Um, it, it's in a basement. It's like it's a trap, and it's like, well, what, what makes you think that it's in a basement? <laughs> Um, so there's like a bit of speculation. Oh, can we trust her? It's like, well, you know, um, and Fastbender's all about being or- like following orders. So they they come down. We find um, uh, what um, what's the name? Sorry, Shoshana. No, uh, the Bridget von Hammersmark. Yeah, but yeah, fa- yeah, from Bridget von Hammersmark. Uh, at the bar, she's playing the. Uh, the card they're playing game. this yeah. game where they put uh, a, a name. It's like shards, isn't it? Basically, well, yeah. But they put basically you put a fe- well, it would be a post-it now, effectively on your <laughs> head, and it might have the name of a film or a film star or whatever. You haven't seen it, 
and you ask questions to guess what it is you've got like written no on game. your head. The one they, the one we see them play is King Kong. It's quite interesting. I think that's interesting. You know how, like, basically, it's Tarantino's view on how he sees King Kong. That's basically the, the narrative of. Um, uh, is I it... thought every comment he made was it was obviously King Kong, and then they guess wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, he was always King Kong, and he says, "Oh, the." Um, no, he's so like King Kong. King, <laughs> King Kong's is what they they play with the the German yeah. fella. Where it's like he, he's one, he's one of he's one of got King yeah. That's Kong. what I'm saying. But yeah. they get it wrong, even they, they though it's, it wrong, all yeah. the questions are really lead King you Kong. to King Kong. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he says something else completely different. Well, yeah, he does. He says something that isn't King Kong. King Dong. King Dong. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I have found this scene so tense. There's like three or four in this film. This scene was just so, so fucking tense because we know him and Stiglitz are just yeah. surrounded by the enemy. And they're in a basement. That that really adds to it, that detail of being in a basement, that feeling of absolute claustrophobia and no escape. Mm. And he's immediately picked up on his accent. We see very similar with Hans Lander talking to the bastards later where he gets them to say things several times and it's like, is it because you, you are picking up on their accent or what? Yeah. Um, he, he's told he's got an unusual accent. Uh, the guy behind the bar has become a father that morning. Um, this stuff. What did we think of the scene? Oh no! Is it is it one of the um one of the officers rather than the guy behind the bar? That's yeah, the guy behind the bar. Oh, yeah. Because he begs for his life at the end because he's just become a father. Yeah, but oh. he's he's dived behind the bar. He's 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 a German officer. Yes. I got uh, Apologies. Pay attention, Bond. <laughs> um yeah it's it's a really really tense scene again uh and mm. he's he's cast really well with like the, the really sort of suspicious slimy looking german officers <laughs> like like the guy oh he looks he looks really like you know fits in that scene really well he's really just hands it up to like such a such a, a deliciously devious but suspicious kind of like level and you just think oh my god this, this is not going to end well and you think you, you really don't know how it's going to end you don't it's, it's like the lander scene uh you don't know whether this is all going to be blow up or this is just going to be like oh well well, well I guess i'm wrong see you later it's uh i, I find it quite it, an uncomfortable scene to watch yeah. in the best possible way yeah um I, what, why are they there? Is it to get sort of tickets or to get to talk her into a place at the premiere? I think, or, it... or to test him out or to check him out in the same way that Lander had to check out Shoshana? I think it was just literally a, a meeting point and they didn't know that, you know, because it was an assumption that, like, it, the, everywhere, everywhere's going to be quiet tonight, so this is going to be a safe bet, it's indiscreet, no one around. But uh, one of the, the guy in the bars become a father, which yeah. probably has something to do with it. Yeah, and then Bob okay. C. Yeah, and he's really like... thought this through, Tarantino, hasn't he? Genuinely, he really has. I think yeah, he's, he's thought through every detail. I think uh, because it's the premiere as well. I think because I'm not sure how far it is from the premiere. I don't know, but there was something about like, okay. yeah. But I know it was like, uh... yeah, okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, what gives him away is they're, they're suspicious anyway because of his accent. Yeah, he, he, order... he calls the other two like Frankfurt and Munich, doesn't he? He orders a drink at one... he orders three more drinks at one stage, and he puts up his three middle fingers. I.e., if you count your thumb, little finger is the outside fingers. He puts up the three middle fingers, and what Shoshana later reveals is that act. And you spot the guy spotting. No, Bridget. Says yeah. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Bridget later points mm. out that actually in Germany, and I don't know if this is true, to signal three, they hold up. Yeah, the uh, finger, full finger, and, uh, mid finger, thumb. And and thumb. Yeah. Um, now, I, I don't know whether that's true, but in the world of the world, world of the film, it works really well. We see the German officer who's uh, a bit suspicious anyway. Spot that drinking from uh, a massive boot. Drinking from a massive boot. <laughs> this part looks kind of fun, apart Pretty from the it. fact you get you'd be getting pissed with Nazis. Yeah, and just get shot to shit at the end of the night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was blasted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's a good scene. It's Holy one, hell! To be the one scene in the film, I think it's a, is a little bit long. 
Well, but it is really tense. Yeah, I mean, it has like two state. It, it builds up because it's you know you, you go straight into it and you have the the you have the awkward bit where they kind of like right okay we'll have to sort of like just casually have a drink now and just you know let's just not be suspicious then we'll just quietly leave because obviously I've had to because Bridget has had to, had to sort of like say oh, I'm waiting for friends and it'd be a bit weird if like friends arrive and I just leave. Well, the other thing, of course, is had this bar been quiet. It would have um, mad. I, I don't know with the sexual politics of the time, but she could have done all the talking or bought all the drinks. Mm. That's the bit where I say sexual politics of the time. If a man and a woman go into a bar, is the woman all right to just go up to the bar? But as as I suppose she's like a, a film celebrity. legend, maybe she could just make it part of her meet and greet. Yeah. Or he could talk to one or two people who are less important or just talk to the barman who probably wouldn't say anything. Probably didn't think he was going to be sort of surrounded by middle-ranking German Mm. officers like this um and he's under pressure for the first moment and he actually holds out really well and uh, and knowing michael fassbender as i now do when he actually said do you mind if i go out speaking the kings Mm. i said the king's english is is what he means uh can i go out speaking my native tongue is what he's saying uh he didn't sound irish for once he didn't sound Irish for once. No, he didn't. <laughs> oh, that's off the monitor. Here. <laughs> well, oh boy. I feel really bit bad for him. Though. It was obviously because in, in um, was he when he when he's Harry Holler and um in the Snowman. Obviously, he got slated like, obviously because it was like um a sort of a Nordic production um or adaptation um of Nordic bit like with all English accents. And I just kind of think he does he there's a few missteps but generally he does accents quite good so i kind of feel a bit like Argh. there's a just... there's a bit in first class right once it's once you hear it yeah first class is there. weird because I, I don't i'm not sure if i even noticed it on first viewing i think i did but i'm not sure but there's a bit where they're at whatever mansion they're at where he starts losing his tempo it's basically him basically saying i'm out of here yeah and and as soon as he loses his composure the actor loses the cover of his accent yeah. So and he sounded ludicrously Irish, and then when he was on the beach at the end during the sort of Cuban Missile Crisis, it, it could have been in fucking Father Ted. I promise <laughs> you, it's really, really strong once you notice oh, it. Very small. <laughs> I hear you're a racist now, <laughs> Father. <laughs> Yeah. Should I be getting all race or something? The That's Cubans, awesome. a great bunch of lads. <laughs> <laughs> Check out Father Ted if you're not from this country and haven't seen it. It's one of the funniest sitcoms oh, ever made. So funny. Hilarious. Uh, no, the really... Great Little Hunt is an absolute genius. Um, yeah, same guy, same guy who went on to write the IT crowd, although he wrote it with someone. But yeah, it's really good. Black Book's also so funny. Yeah, I think he only wrote on part of that. I don't think he was no, the main still, I still think he's very, very funny. Yeah, but it, his main work will be Father Ted and the IT yeah. crowd. Those will be the two. Yeah, things. that'll be his, like, his legacy. Um, anyway, moving on. So, yeah, uh, so Fassbender, basically, uh, there, there's a big, yeah, Stiglitz goes for it, gets... Uh, he gets, just goes, gets say, say hello to your Nazi, what the fuck, and just shoots him in the dick, basically. Yeah, 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 because it's a standoff. They're all like, they've yeah. got their pot, he's got a gun pointed at Fassbender, Stiglitz got a gun pointed at this guy's cock, and I think effectively it's just, well, we're going to die anyway, so I'm going to shoot his dick off. That that's what it is. Mm. There's no sort of let's try and talk our way out of the Stiglitz from the start. It's like, well, we're going to die here, so I'm yeah. Going to... And there's really sort of like he puts him in a moral dilemma because because they do try and say like, okay, let's just calmly walk out. And he goes, oh no 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 no, like, uh, and he sort of uses the fact that um, the guy the guy's father as like kind of like as, as the reason why no that's not going to happen because I'm 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 going to start speaking out and then that then. Basically, everyone's going to end up dying. So, yeah, what are absolutely. you going to do? And it's kind of like, oh, you twat. But yeah, no, this, uh, there are bits I've either missed or forgotten. Uh, the bastards turn up at the bar. Ob- obviously, after everyone's been shot to shit, and Von Hammersmark is is there. But yeah, hurt. you you've got. How to... did they know to turn up there? You have. What the... were they? What were they? Obviously, the bastards end up at the premiere. But what's their plan when they turn up at the ba- at the bar? Do we know? Uh, what well, at the at the thing? Well, basically, you have everyone shot to shit, and you have the the, the only the soldier who's a father. He's the only one left. Apart well, I guess Stiglitz was Bridget. in there, though, wasn't he? Apart from yeah, apart from Bridget, who is like so. Perhaps the, perhaps the bastards were actually just trying to protect Fassbender. 
I think to get him to the premiere. They that's it. They're trying to protect him. So hence Pam B when she's hurt and all the rest of it is shit. Um, what acts are, right? We'll have to come with you. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. So she they end up like sort of making a, a bargain, saying, "Well, if you don't come out here, we'll throw grenades down." And he goes, "Okay, well, I'll put good." And then she just shoots him. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then you have the bit where Brad Pitt is like sort of sticking his thumb in it. In, in yeah, they get they get her to they get her to like uh, a makeshift. Well, it it is almost like a disused hospital mm. type room. They've got her on like what would be an operating table, stroke um, uh, examination table. One of the two. Mm. You've got. Aldo Aldo Rain there, which is Brad Pitt's character, and I never remember the other names except Donnie Donowitz, but you've got BJ Novak's character there, who I can never remember the name of. I am looking at it now, because I've got the Wikipedia page up, but that's almost like cheating. Uh, who's the other guy? The other guy we know, we see. Stiglitz. No, not Stiglitz. <laughs> Stiglitz is dead. You're just, you're just naming shit now, aren't you? I mean, I wish he wasn't. The, yeah, but... the one who does the third best Italian. I love Lamp. Uh, just saying things. You, I love Lamp. Would you like to come to the pants party? <laughs> I'm in my pants. Uh, okay, so... The, the, loud the, noises, Chief. We've loud noises. We've got the four of them there. Three are going to get in. Three of them are going to sort of get into the... I'm 6% pants. real panther. You've like, got... So here's a question for you. Is this a suicide mission? Because I didn't pick this up until this view. Like, I, they, they literally got strapped to the legs. Uh, are they are they going there literally just to like? I don't know if that's just to get it in and then you take it off your legs. I don't know. I genuinely don't know. I, I think so because they are willing to fucking die for it when push comes to shove, yeah. but not necessarily. Um, the whole point is film is incredibly uh, film of this era is incredibly it, it like burns, you know I don't know five times faster than paper or something. It's incredibly flammable, mm. so. Uh, a cinema is a great place to try and kill them because basically, if you can shut them in and, and start a fire, they're they're going to die very quickly. They also find out that Hitler's going to be at this, don't they? Mm. I think that might come out. I can't remember where that comes out. It might come out at this point because they're totally like, yes, we've got to get in there. If Hitler... oh, they'll be find out when they're there, don't they? We we as the viewer know Hitler's going to be there. Because I think Frederick Zoller is told, but I think the bastards find out once we get there. Like shit, they're all here. Mm. That's right. Yeah, because so, that, that that motivates them, like the other yeah. bastards, to um, yeah, to like to get uh, to actually no uh, fuck this. We're we're, we're doing this, are yeah. we? Well, yeah, that's the thing. Because Van Ho- Van Hammersmark Van Hommers- Hammersmark Von Hammersmark, sorry, is injured by this point, so she doesn't want to go. She's like, mm. well, I'm shot. How am I going to do this? So they basically say, well, you've you've had a skiing accident or something like that. And then it's, okay, how do we get in because we don't speak the language? Mm. And it comes out that Germans have a very, they speak a bit of, what languages do you speak? And it turns out Aldo speaks a bit of Italian. So <laughs> I love the way he kind of claims, well, I'm, obviously I'm the most fluent, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he clearly and, doesn't know anything. <laughs> well, he obviously knows some words or he can speak, but that's about it. Then he goes second, but it's when they get the second and third most fluent, and he goes, well, I can't speak Italian. He said, exactly, you're the third most fluent, right? <laughs> um, but she makes the point that Germans tend to be very poor at picking up an Italian accent, or a, a correct Italian accent, i.e., if you're speaking Italian, providing you're not doing it in the German, with a German accent, they're not going to pick up if you're doing it with a British accent or something. Yeah, that's well, if it's what just I like a bad. If you just do a bad impersonation of Italian. Yeah, if you, if you do the words, they won't pick up on it, is what they're saying. Mm. And again, that's great till Hans Lander starts speaking to them later, and we've got absolutely no fucking idea whether he's suspicious or not. In fact, he almost certainly is, because he keeps asking them to repeat themselves. Well, he, well he's already on it, because he's found uh, the shoe. She left a, a shoe at the, at the, at the Sorry, bar. Sorry, we'll get to that. Yes, that's right. When she was shot, the shoe came off. Which, so, you, think, which, uh, you, which you think, that's a, such a fucking rookie mistake. Don't leave it anything but yeah and of course there'll be lots of women in the world with that size shoe but obviously not necessarily later at the premiere where you know a conspirator died and also she signed something mm. she, she kissed her thing and signed yeah. it for that Again, that's another thing. Well, she's one thing but yeah that's that's the thing she actually signed uh the uh an autograph Yes, but in and of itself, had nothing happened that night, that wouldn't have been a problem because yeah, no. she's drinking with Nazis. The next night, she's going to a Nazi premiere. There's actually nothing. 
suspicious there. It's only mm. the guy that's been killed turns out to be a British undercover guy and was drinking with her. So, yeah, that's that's really, really bad. But um, so, yeah, they, they basically cast her leg up and head off to the night of the premiere. And actually, we go back to Shoshana for cat people. Which is a, uh, a great scene, even though you would not expect that song to go to work he as was well. Asked, they said, what are you going to do then? If you're set in a film in the 1940s, what are you going to do when you use like contemporary soundtracks and all that? He said, well, why can't I? Well, what 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 says I've got to use something mm. pre nineteen forty four? I mean, it's fair. He's mostly used like actually old film scores, like a lot of he um, has and, and he, yeah, and he carries a lot of western stuff. stuff, lot of um. There's always a lot of western. Marconi, a lot of Marconi, that, that kind of thing. Lot of stuff from like yeah, One Silver Dollar, and yeah, there's a lot of Morricone stuff in there. Mm. Um, but the point is, um, he's gone and used Cat People, which is a song from. Uh, Cat People, the film, the Natasha, Natasha Kinski film, Cat People. Mm. Um, is that well, that's remake a, of... That's early 80s. Uh, I don't know if it's a remake, but I've, if it is a remake, it's the only one I've seen. Mm. Uh, I haven't seen the original. I'm looking it up now. Uh, Natasha Kinski was like big news for a while. Yeah, the original Cat People was 1942, but I've not seen that. I haven't. Yeah, it's beautiful, actually, when she's getting ready for her night. And she knows what's going to happen. She knows what's going to happen. She's been preparing the projector. A bit of a love letter to film this. We see the projector in quite a lot of detail, mm. don't we? we, yeah, we and how it's going to work. We see her plan her own little uh, extra video, special video for them. What she's done is spliced in, and we see her do this in quite a lot of detail, but I, I forgive him this. Because the thing is now, now everything is digital, which I don't mind to a degree because the world does move on, and also it does mean it doesn't degrade in the same way. It is really lovely to see celluloid, though. I didn't actually mind watching her like splice these bits together and stuff, and the mm. different reels. I don't, um, I don't over romanticize it in that I don't wish that's what we had now, but it's still lovely to see. She splices in a film of her fucking laughing at the German high commander. She's about to kill them because the point is, her Marcel is going to basically start a fire behind the screen, and because it's film, it's going to burn fast. And she's going to lock them all in. That's what's going to happen. So we see, yeah, we, we see exactly when it's going to happen in the film. And between them, they've worked out, they know exactly when in Nation's Pride that's going to happen. So we get to the, so we're now, yeah, we're now on the evening of the premiere. This cinema is beautiful. Yeah, I almost want to. The lobby area. Yeah, I almost want to watch a film there. <laughs> yeah. I probably would leave off all the swastikas and stuff. But oh yeah, but they're, they're just. But it is beautiful. It is a beautiful sim- cinema. That everyone's there, um, and Bridget von Hammersbach is there with uh, Han- uh, Aldo and his- and the other two. Yeah, Brad Pitt doing something ridiculous with his chin. Yeah, as I say, I had problems with this on on all the posters and stuff, but he's possibly a little bit nervous as well. To a degree, because he's he's really narrowing his eyes during it. I mean, mm. Hans Lander goes up, is introduced, and he literally goes "Bonjourno," in, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, Bonjourno. Uh, but he says that with really narrowed eyes, like he's like, "What's what's this guy up to?" Yeah, you know, what's going he, on? You can see he's like, "What's Hans Lander up to here?" Yeah. Or it might just be his general distaste for Nazis. It might just be like, "I don't, I'm not comfortable being this close to this many Nazis." <laughs> Um, they're all wearing like tuxes <coughs> they all look like waiters he's wearing a white tux <coughs> um, and what yeah basically you've got Eli Roth and I think I forget which of the bastards are going where a couple of them are basically going into the main um, auditorium with, um, with with dynamite around their legs but BJ Novak's in there somewhere and he's not one of those two so I'm not quite sure who's going where but I know that it's funny because they're walking through and they're going like Scorsi and stuff like that. <laughs> Scorsi. And also, when they're asked their name, they're doing that sort of almost like fine food thing with their hands. Like, <laughs> what of like, yeah, with the, uh, <laughs> I know what you mean, with the thumb and the index finger, just go like. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, ooh, lovely. And it's just a lovely little touch. I think it's really nice. It's so funny, this. And yeah, and Landis clearly fucking with them, asking him to repeat the thing again and again. And then he asks for a word with um, Bridget. Yeah. In private. 
and asks her to reach in, they sit down on chairs opposite each other and again for the, about the fourth scene in this film now is really tense so we don't know what's happened i'm not sure if we saw them pick the shoe up originally yeah we I did think, i thought we saw it in flashback after this i i, I remember about the scene picking up the uh i saw him in the we see him in the we see them in the bar picking it up but I don't know if we see it mm. before this scene or in flashback during this scene. I, I see. Yeah. You saw it today. Which is it? Do you know? Because I thought when she reached in for the the the, he gets her to reach into the pocket of his coat, which is on the back of the chair she sat on. Mm. She reaches in, and pulls out, basically her own shoe. Yeah. And I didn't think we'd seen that shoe at that point. I thought it was immediately then, like a flashback to them getting it in the bar. Maybe not. It doesn't really. Matter. Yeah. I, I, I remember it being um, he finds a shoe on the napkin like the previous we see yeah. yes I saw, them find, saw them find that but I don't know if it was before this because I don't think when he goes off for a word we know he knows because he's always he always knows and he's always got a way of knowing but I didn't know that he'd found the evidence anyway it doesn't matter puts the shoe on it fits perfectly and he turns instantly and strangles her mm. Mm. Which is quite brutal to say the it's least. It's quite grim, isn't it? And it's kind of it's unflinching as well as, um, but as, as you know, as we all know, Tarantino does violence with a flair. It was just the just the breaking of the tension on the scene. Yeah. Because he hasn't burst into violence so far against the person he's talking to. Generally, mm. I mean, yes, there was no. violence at the end of the first scene, but it's not like he suddenly broke on like Lapidi or anything. No. Yeah. But it wasn't um, him doing it, he was ordering no, it. No, I know. It's, it's, quite, it's quite restrained, restrained in this film, isn't it, I will say. He suddenly let forward and did that, and, and actually looks a bit fucking mental doing it. Well, you know, you wonder if, if how Tarantino has even thought as far as Von Hammersmark might have been a hero of Landers, cinematic hero, because he actually goes at her like he feels really betrayed, like he's been betrayed by a bit of a hero of his, or maybe he had a crush on her, I don't know. I don't know. We've got the loving foot, yeah. foot fetch bit again, haven't we? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I was going to say maybe he's just um, patriotic, but obviously that's not the case. <laughs> obviously not, yeah. So anyway, Von Hammersmark's been killed, and we he immediately says to somebody, the guy in the white tux, and uh, and uh, <laughs> that bit just gets barreled to the ground, which was in all the trailers. It made <laughs> it look like this film was going to be really slapstick. And so they're onto them. The, the bastards are mm. in the building, but I don't think they immediately know who, who all the bastards are, or where they are. Yeah. And we're at all this time we're watching Nation's Pride, which is just literally this guy shooting person after person after person after person from a bell tower. Then, then looking a bit like you know heroic <laughs> for, for, uh, uh, and the Nazis, for a short time. It's the only time the Nazis are portrayed a little bit cartoonish in the. Um, they're all kind of like enjoying this a bit sadistically in the audience. They're kind of laughing at it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then we then we have the scene where um, Emmanuel's ready to burn the place down, and then what do you know? It Zola gets a little bit horny. Yes, he popped into uh, he pops in for a bit of a chat to the screening room, and she's like, "You can't be in here." He, he's basically gone in for a little bit of a. He's, he's he's been hoping to get some, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I think he thinks if she watches his exploits, she she might almost like get a bit. He's just thinking like private private room by, as well. Excited and... by the idea of him, yeah, yeah, definitely. I felt sorry for him until he t- takes it a stage too far. Until mm. he takes it a stage too far, you're totally like, well, yeah. From your perspective, you're being really nice. That she's talking to you like shit. You're gonna lose context. Mm. That number of years as an occupying force, you, you almost forget you are. I'd have thought. I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying we should sympathise for him. I'm saying the. No, 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 no. no. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Do you feel like oh, he's just not getting it? And then it's like, oh no, he is a bit of a. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then, so they they effectively end up shooting each other, don't they? Yeah, it ends up quite quite, quite violent, and she she shoots him. Um, mm. And then she has a moment of weakness where she goes over to see if he's yeah. okay, and he reveals his gun and shoots her. Yeah, and yeah, that's just like a glorious shot as well. Even though when she's getting shot, mm. could, yeah, that again is a, is a really, really good, really good shot. And then 
Is covered it... by the incense, incessant shooting in the film. Yeah. So the film they're watching, they might have heard like a sound that sounds like it came from somewhere else, but it's totally consistent with the soundtrack. Wait, it's just war for gunshots, isn't it? So like, it, that's the, the film is just shooting on pawn shooting upon yeah. shooting. Pure propaganda film. Um, and then so you have, and while that is going on, you have they they figure out Hitler's there, so they decide, no, oh, fuck it, we'll do our own thing. So they do their own little. Uh... They've got the guns hidden in the glove. I like that. That's quite a clever trick, isn't it? I like that. I really do. They have their own like homemade little sort of thing, don't they? They kind of like, yeah. And, and they're kind of thinking about, okay, how you know, how far is he? Can you think you make it? Well, have to. <laughs> this kind of, yeah. this kind of, it's very much kind of doing it on the fly. Yeah. It's and great. Then, and at the same time, obviously, B. J. Novak and Brad Pitt have been captured and taken to a private location to meet with Mister Lander. Mm-hmm. So. It's it's all going off now. It's really cool. At the same time, uh, she's lying dead or dying, and and we get to the bit of the film where she has spliced in her gloating, which is Marcel's sign to set the thing on fire. Mm. So now the building is on fire. The bastards are trying to get as effectively wine waiters to Hitler, which they just about do. And as as the place is starting to explode and everything else, they're shooting him in the face. Yeah, they're just they're basically just machine gun everyone, like everyone yeah. in that sort of thing with, with with bullets, and then they just machine gun everyone else. But this is like um, all that happens at once as the place is getting caught on fire. You have her message kind of just portrayed on 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 smoke to now to agree with her manically laughing. We all had like a Wizard of Oz vibe. I just I was going to say I've yeah, seen that shot somewhere much. before. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm glad, okay. I'm, you know, I'm glad you, you said that as well. Yeah, I, just I wouldn't thought... have noticed it, but I'm not a big, um, I'm not, a big, I'm not very knowledgeable on the Wizard of Oz. I've, I've seen it, of course, but not for a very, yeah. very long time. I, I don't know if ever that says like an in reference to that, or whether it just like I, I he, think he it liked is, the shot. That might be, or well, no, I, an intentional reference. I don't know whether it's like meant to be like in, in, in terms of like any meaningful way, or just that like, he just liked the shot. Yeah, it's just... He liked the shot, but it evokes yeah. the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. And, and th- also, when you think of when the Wizard of Oz was made as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. true. It's this era of film. So uh, the, the place is going up. The, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen fire shot better. It looks beautiful, and the colour saturation of it, it all looks, looks yeah. wonderful. The colour in the film um, is, is fantastic. Now, I've, I've read that Tarantino struggled with the ending of this, which is one of the reasons he moved on to Kill Bill. I think some of it was this, because he got to the point where he was like, naturally here we'd kill Hitler. And he thought, but Hitler didn't die. Hitler died in 45 in a bunker and all the rest of it. And the way he justified it to himself was he said, well, in that's because the bastards didn't exist. In my world, they did. Uh-huh. So therefore, the alternate history is because there are people in the Tarantino movie, in the Tarantino universe, that can take Hitler out this way. Mm-hmm. So it does create almost an alternate history. Basically, victory in Europe would have been about a year earlier in Tarantino's universe because Hitler would have was yeah. defeated in forty four, not forty five. Yeah. So effectively ending, yeah, ending the war a whole year earlier. So. so that's basically the end of that. Shoshana's dead. Frederick Zoller's dead. Hitler, Goebbels and all that are dead. The German high command is dead. So the war is over, effectively. They're all dead, Dave. And you've now got <laughs> Hans Lander sat with um, with um, Brad Pitt and BJ Novak. Yeah, or- negotiating. Well, this is like before this has happened anyway. So they're negotiating like, uh, I want I want to uh, I want free. a house given to me in America as like, and he says where in America he wants it as a thank you for my wonderful service. I'll have been in on it all along. I was a double agent. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. He, he wants. He wants all. He wants like not the Victoria Cross, but whatever the equivalent in this film was. Victoria which, Cross is a British medal, but yeah. which you can say like you know it is like an like a, an offer that they can't refuse. Like, well, we can end the war now, and just give this twat whatever he wants. At this stage as well, they don't. They they don't know if this plot's worked. Yeah, I don't. Do they know at this point Hitler's died? Because he does have a phone there. I don't um, think they know, do they? I don't know. I think there is there is something of like, how do I know? How, you know, do, do you bring it up? Whether I had to know I could trust you or something. Um, 
Uh, okay, okay, well that's fine. It's also got the one line in the film that got the biggest laugh. That's a bingo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. But, but again, it's a, it's a big turning point. You think like, fuck it, this this lander guy has just been. It, he just made us like tense for like at, at least two or three scenes, and. We've always kind of think fucking hell, and all of a sudden now we're we'll sitting across the table from Brad Pitt, basically saying like, "Yeah, well, you know, I can kill it if you want. We can end the war now if you want. Just give me my freedom. I'm fine. You know, we'll be all good." It's just kind of like really like left field term and no idea. You know, no, I'd never see this coming in a million years. Yeah, uh, he, he shows no sign of being a turncoat, certainly, uh, but. Yeah, they, so they, they, they kind of agree to all this. Aldo calls it in, you know, or he talks to the right person, coerced, obviously. And so the deal's done that they're going to be handed over at some checkpoint in... Um, I, I can't remember who's in handcuffs. Is it? I think it's Lando who's in handcuffs, isn't it? Uh, Which way round is it? I know they swap over, don't they? I saw, yeah. yeah, I think basically it's going to be, you know, the, he surrendered to mm. them or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and then it's just the moment where he says, what are you going to do with your uniform? And he's going, I know what's coming. <laughs> well, it's, it's just like the... Uh, he just shoot, he, he, at first he like, shoots his, like, the, the other officer. It's like, like yeah. fucking hell, they like, deal with both of us. Like, yeah, but they don't really give a shit about him, do they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's another Nazi you can kill. Yeah. Before you're going to be stopped from killing Nazis any moment because the war's over. Yeah, I'll get shouted at, but... Not in yeah, I'll, I'll get chewed out a bit, but yeah. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then he carves it into his head, and I love the fact that he says that uh, this might be my your masterpiece. Written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you go much. And it's almost like a bit more satisfa- satisfactory seeing like Landers scream in pain as he's getting fucking you know, uh, yeah. literally uh, just he might, for life. Early, he may have had very early plastic surgery around here because I know after the Battle of Britain we had burnt pilots who, who they did sort of very early mm. um, yeah but very uh, often unfortunately like war and, and things like that yeah. do tend to be a, a sort of a um, catalyst for medical uh, medical. Advances. yeah there was a there was a TV show about 1990 something like that called A Perfect Hero and I'm going off memory because I, I, I haven't seen it in nearly 30 years uh, but it had Nigel Havers in it, who fought in like the Battle of Britain or something like that, got badly burnt, and they'd done like experimental, what were the beginnings of plastic surgery on him. So whether these people who had been disfigured could have had anything done about it, I don't know. I really don't, but it's just, it's, it's kind of grim, the carving into their head and stuff. So. But that's it, Inglorious Bastards. What do we think, folks? Um... I- a very solid piece of work from Mr. Quentin Tarantino. Um, I, I, I think it's probably one of his best directed uh, films. Uh, even though I think, I think the film could have there's something lacking from the script. There's just something that needs to be tightening or altered somewhat to make it perfect mm. for me. But I, you know, it got good performances. It's funny. It it does what you want. It's very watchable. You know, I can't really knock it too much. You know, just for being a little bit just off centre, and plus also, it's nice to have a film that's just a bit like left field, like it doesn't do the things you expect it to do. So, yeah, no, I I, I really enjoyed the, my view of it last month. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really say anything different to that, really. To be honest, um, yeah, it's pretty much Tarantino back to form. Um, yeah, so it goes, you know, it's a little bit kind of random. Um, well, I think probably the only bum note would probably be Mike Myers, maybe. But, um, yeah, it's pretty much kind of on point. There's, you know, scripts on there, characters on there. I thought um, it was groovy, baby, yeah. <laughs> attention to detail as well. I mean, I mean, obviously, they're going to be a few, like, historical inaccuracies here and there. Um, but largely, it's kind of on point. Um, Characterisation is really good. Um, but, yeah, as I say, it was a very long film. But I said there's very few aspects that do, that do drag for me. Um, but yeah, no, so it's the best cutie film in by Country Mile. Um, I would agree with Becca on that. Um, I think Becca came into this series expecting probably to be saying that about Kill Bill. And, and all the way through this series, I just knew that whatever we were watching, there was this absolute gem a few weeks in. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit more about her next week, but this is the last contribution to Tarantino's Callan of Sally, Sally Menke. Sally mm. Menke was his uh, was his editor. She died. She died at the age of 56 in 2010, just after this film. But Django Unchained feels a lot like this film to me, even though it's like a Western. Maybe it's the Hans Lander, you know, copy in the sort of uh, character he plays in that film. Maybe it's the, stru- the structure, the format. Maybe it's, you know, the film stock. It could be any number of things, but it feels like a baggy version of this. And when I look back now, the two films that follow this don't have quite the same discipline and it's easy to look at this and go well it's over two and a half hours it's already pretty long but there's not much i'd remove from it yet scenes can always be tightened but scenes are always going to be given room to breathe because it's quentin tarantino he's he's gonna he's gonna let them he's gonna let them breathe a little bit in the bar and actually it's in four places i can think of in the film and they're the four places of, of of strongest tension I went into this film a little bit nervous because I'd seen all the posters and I just thought this looks really cartoonish. But I think the bastards are probably the weakest part of the film, even though there's a couple of really funny bits with them, you know, Bon Giorno and all that kind of shit. It's really funny. Uh, And Brad Pitt being sort of of tumbled to the ground and all that. I mean, there's a lot I like about it. But the the gold of all this is, is Shoshana. It's Hans Lander, who might be the best character he's ever written. Certainly the best character ever realized in the, you know, as written, it could have been played by somebody else and maybe not been as good. Realised by it's the right a, person. It's a film that is 30% in the English language. And if you'd have asked me to guess, I, I'd have said it was 80% in the English language. Because I'll read whole scenes that are basically uh, Christoph Waltz talking in German or French or whatever it might be, German most of the time. And I would have sworn at the end of the scene, if you'd switched it off and go, well, said, so what language were they speaking then? I'd have gone, oh, I don't know, was it English? I can't remember. You know, I, I I never even really noticed I was reading this film because it just drew me in. I can't watch it as much as I can watch a Jackie Brown. I can't watch it as much as I can watch a, a Kill Bill Volume 1. Uh, but I think he got it right at the end. This might just be his masterpiece. Uh, I love it. Absolutely terrific. And there we are with Inglorious Bastards. After a long-awaited return. So, um, I'm still feeling a little bit uneducated, Dave. I, I'm feeling very uneducated. I mean, I couldn't... No wonder I didn't know it was in subtitles. I can't read. So, uh... It's a miracle we managed to talk about the film at all, really. I, I've, just, I've just guessed the plot. I called up the Wikipedia <laughs> page. Couldn't read that either. Um, I, I think this is the sort of thing where we need... A Hollywood, a legend like a Bridget von Hammersmark to come along and educate us. Well, she couldn't be in there today, but you'll just have to deal with me instead. <laughs> After being strangled by. <laughs> I was being strangled <laughs> by stuff <laughs> out. Oh dear. Fun fact number one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Instantly, that's fun, folks. Go on. <laughs> oh dear. So, yeah, talk about kind of English, well, this one obviously traverses many English languages. Um, so obviously Christopher Waltz won the Oscar for this film, but obviously playing character that mostly spoke in a foreign language. He speaks German, French, and Italian, as well as English. Um, other actors to do that are Sophia Loren, Robert De Niro, Roberto Benigni, Benicio Del Toro, and Marion Cotillard. They're all multilingual. Um, obviously, as, as we mentioned previously, obviously this is Sally Minka's last film, obviously to... Um, well, not the last film, but last film of Tarantino, last film of Tarantino's to be edited, um, and obviously, obviously, Rod Taylor's last film. Obviously, he long since retired from acting, but was tempted back to portray Churchill, um, and sadly, I almost didn't recognise him. But never mind. It was still a very fine performance. To blink and you miss him. Um, yeah, which I think, yeah, Christopher Fox, obviously, his character also speaks the most language in the film, English, French, German, and Italian. Um, he actually dubs himself in the German version of this film. I think the same could be said for Spectre. Um, it's Little Daniel who also dubs himself in Spanish, in the Spanish language version of this film. Um, let's have a look. Oh, yes, yeah, Brad Pitt's character, assuming the um, the Italian director, um, Enzo Gonomi, I can't pronounce it unfortunately, is the best name of Enzo Castello, also the director of 1978's The Inglorious Bastards. 
Oh yeah, has anyone actually seen the uh, original film? I've never, I never have. No, no, no. me never, unfortunately. No, no. Although next week I, I have a feeling I've seen the original Django because I recognise the the lead who cameos in the film, but I yeah. can't tell you anything about it. I've I've heard of it, but it's he's the, the series um, I've never seen, unfortunately. But I, I am aware of its he, legacy. He he's the drug lord in uh, Die Hard Two. Oh. Maybe that's why I recognise him. Then I don't that know, but I... he, he, he's in like loads of. But stuff. when I saw him, I was like, "That's the original Django." So I don't, I don't know. I thought I'd seen Django. So Maybe too. it is. Well, uh, it, it definitely is, but it's whether I've seen it or not, or whether I was just made aware of it before I saw it. But no, it, to answer your actual question, the spelling's different. Of course, you'll have to be careful when you put the episode out. But the spelling of the original Inglorious Bastards mm. is different. Uh, but it's a 1978 film, and that's all I know about it. I think that, that that was actually Bastards with with an A, and this is unless Bastards it was the original e. Django that was a nineteen seventy eight film. I, I lose my fucking thread on these things. The Django series was running for a long time, though, isn't it? Well, I kind of think of this Django Unchained as sister films, even though they're set in different eras. They just mm-hmm. feel of a piece to me. Sure. Um, All, but... Also, uh, Franco Nero, who played Django, he's in um, John Wick Two. He's like ah. the the guy in. Uh... Yeah, but obviously John Wick 2 didn't exist at this point. So no. He's... Oh, yeah, true, true. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. All I'm saying is, uh, have I seen the original? I'm almost certain I haven't. And it is a 1978 film. We're looking at it now. But no, I haven't seen it. Speaking the of remake Django, of the else... Dirty Dozen. It's remake of the Dirty Dozen, loosely, apparently. Okay. It's got Fred Williamson in it, though. That makes sense. Hmm. Okay. Um, also, fun fact... Um... Obviously, there's a lot of talk of DiCaprio uh, being the Lando role before mm-hmm. casting uh, yes. the the unknown uh, tal- uh, talent of um, Christoph Waltz. Uh, I also, I'm, I read an interview uh, at, at the time as well that uh, that Fassbender actually read for the role of Lando as well because he could speak German. Oh. So he actually went, went went in and but still got got a role as uh, the British op. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, because it's such a transcendent performance mm. and one of the best things, and the only thing, is the only actor who's ever delivered dialogue as well as um, Tarantino's dialogue anywhere near as well as sort of a Samuel L. Jackson. Mm. Although, bizarrely, I, I in a foreign language, I still recognise it as Tarantino dialogue. It's bizarre. But, um, <laughs> you have an ear for it. Well, I, I think it's more I have an eye for it. I can I could almost see it, but well, that's actually structured very like Tarantino, right? So, sure. Um, but I but think it's, it's a lot of dialogue, a lot of dialogue based. But I think it's it's largely down to how it's shot. Like I think I think, I think you're just shot. you're it's just engrossed in it, and you're just like well, yeah. yeah. But um, so obviously it's very di- you know very now difficult now even with the Leonardo DiCaprio I think is an excellent actor to look at it and go oh thank God we got Colonel Hans Land you know him as Hans Land or Christoph Waltz but. Um, bottom line is you don't know they'd have come in with a different interpretation and it might have been great, you just don't know I mean, Di- DiCaprio would have done something quite, in- I think he'd have been a bit more intense in the role I don't know Yeah. but I'm glad we got what we got, there's nothing in this film I'd really change, mm. with the exception of Mike Myers, but even then it's <laughs> not something but even then it's not something I'm particularly angry about, I just look at it and no, go, yeah, I'm not it's fond nice of that to see him. it's just a very odd Casting. Yeah, it, hey, hey, not, why not? You've got the option to use him. Know, why not? I, we, we, we've talked about, you know, um, Michael Madsen and stuff in previous weeks where I've gone, oh, fuck, I wish it wasn't in. <laughs> um, <laughs> We don't feel don't, that way at all. I don't feel that strongly. <laughs> I probably, I probably feel it as profoundly in that. Yes, it definitely should not be Mike Myers here in this film at this point, but it doesn't bother me. It's a really short scene, and what the it's, hell? It's just random occurrence. But so, uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, you know, I think part of it with, with Mike Myers is that we know him as a comedy actor. I think had we never seen Mike Myers before, the only thing you might look at in, is say, is that prosthetics or is that slightly iffy makeup? And that is would that his real nose or you know. Yeah, you'd let it go. I think it's only the fact that we know this is comedy actor Mike Myers there. It's a bit like somebody like a Jim Carrey turning up and playing relatively straight, but you know it's Jim Carrey. Yeah. But with all the makeup, you're not sure if that's signposting that it's meant to be a slightly comedic performance. Exactly. That's the thing I couldn't... Yeah. <laughs> Bizarrely, obviously, for all the great actors in this film, that's the one I get hung up about. Yes, yeah. it, it doesn't I think that's really... Obviously, just as a Bond fan, obviously, Boston Powers is it's quite special to me. Um, and obviously, I love, like, Wayne's World and, you know, um, all the stuff with um, kids' TV back in the 80s and 90s. Um 
especially like being like the wide awake club for example as part of two maps rapidly but that was a bit crazy um but it's just like why are you in this film why are you in this film yeah but yes yeah, it's, it's a very small role very minor it's but, but everyone's it's everyone's made to be and it's done within over and done with within five i mean minutes. it's, it's, it's fine like, it's like for example i don't know for certain whether all the bastards are meant to be jewish well, this but, is it. You, but you throw in Eli Roth and BJ Novak, and you, you immediately go, I think they're Jewish. Therefore, it lends you that air of being it, it lends that air of, I, yes, I, of, course they're go, of course they're going to want to fucking sculpt Nazis. Well, precisely. Revenge. Yeah, I, I think there's always meant to be like that inherent hatred of Nazis, so like generally that'll be most of them would be Jewish. Um, and obviously, you've got like the random one, like Stiglitz, who's, who, who, who is a German. He's just a fucking mental killer, anyway. Well, yeah. yeah, but is that well? That's that's the other thing. We actually don't know why he fucking hates Ger- like Nazis particularly. Like, is is he is he that much of a patriot that he just sees them as a stain on Germany? But uh, you know, normally I'd go well, long running time, and we didn't find that out, so maybe it was overstuffed. But actually, it's not that it's overstuffed. It's the film's not that interested. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter why they feel like they are. They they're just this. You know, they're almost like the Reservoir Dogs in their their own way. And mm-hmm. the, the Reservoir Dogs were a group of guys we didn't really want to know much about. We didn't need to know much about. And it wasn't important because it was just a moment in time and in their lives and careers. It's the same with the Bastards. Their background doesn't matter that much, except Brad Pitt, we know, or Aldo Rain, rather, has a bit of a history of insubordination. And that adds an air of cool to, like, the, the, the grouping, if you like, that, like, they're, they're sort of out on their own and they'll do what the fuck they like. Mm. Um, but beyond that it doesn't really matter who they are um, in all the talking about this film and we have mentioned it in passing I would just like to tip my cap, have a cap in the direction of both mm. Melanie Laurent and Daniel Brühl who don't get talked about a lot because they're overshadowed by a couple of other performances but they're both outstanding yeah definitely they, I, I, Daniel Brühl's one of my well, I, I feel bad that I've not mentioned him before but no he's probably one of my favourite um, actors from the international stage um, of course in um that film Rush. Yeah. Oh yeah, he plays Nicky Lauder in that. Yeah, that fantastic, terrific. absolutely. I'm a Formula it. One fan anyway, so I was inherently interested in that. But uh, he, he's quite an eerie fucking Nicky Lauder from that era. Uh, I can yeah. imagine so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's worth seeing. Nicky Lauder just very briefly uh, had a very tough fight for the title in '76, but in August of that season, he had a crash at the Nurburgring and was trapped in his car while it was on fire. Uh, he's had severe burns for obviously the rest of his life thereafter, uh, but he nearly died because he inhaled so much crap, you know, f- you know, smoke and all the rest of it. Uh, so not only was he pulled from the car and survived, but he was back three or four races later and still nearly won the title. Uh, alongside him, you've got Chris Hemsworth playing James Hunt, which is slightly, slightly loose casting, but it gets the gist of it because James Hunt was quite an incorrigible womanizer and drunk. Um, really worth seeing uh, it's and the Daniel Bull film is Goodbye Lenin um, again I think it's more in the German language yeah. um, but it's, it's very it's very interesting and, and very funny in parts as well whereas I think Melanie Laurent started in started a, I don't think it was porn but it was like erotic films kind of <laughs> thing um, <laughs> and I don't really know what she's done since I'm having a look just to see if I recognise anything well now you see me she was in but I don't really yeah okay <laughs> not, a, not a hell of a lot but um they were both terrific, and I just wanted to mention that because yeah. they get overlooked a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's because she's not done much since, which is kind of a shame because she, mm. she's great in it. Um, she's got a calm. She's got a calm about her, which is necessary if you've got the Nazis mm. who've, who've killed your family and you, they, you don't know whether they know who you are and you've just got to get on with it. Uh, I mean, her reaction when she's released from that meeting effectively. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's like she's just, like, breathing air from, like... But she, I mean, she's both attractive but prickly, so there's a slight ugliness to her character because she's surrounded by Nazis. It's perfectly understandable. But we can't dislike her because she's, like, the main heroine of the film, if you like. So it, it's a difficult role. Plus we really empathise with why she might be acting. Yeah, but you've, she's got to sell all of that, and it's quite difficult. And she has to sit opposite, you know, Nazis in uniform and all the rest of it and not be dim- too diminished by it. I think she's absolutely outstanding. And I've always liked Daniel Brühl, but particularly the aforementioned Rush, um, which is a Ron Howard film for anyone listening in another country who maybe are not particularly aware of Formula One, which is obviously a European sport. 
more or less. I mean, it does race over there, but uh, yeah, it's a Ron Howard film from about 2013 with a really good Hans Zimmer score on it as well. Mm. Yeah, really entertaining watch as well. Seeing if you're not like a fan of Formula One, it's still it's still a good movie. Yeah, I was sort of vaguely aware, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah, film tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. I think if you're like not into that sort of stuff, I think uh, Chris Hemsworth and um, and uh, and Daniel Brawl like just carry the film for you anyway they just like you you enjoy their company enough to just kind of and as characters they're counterpoints to each other yeah. as well which was kind of true you know they they are they played up the rivalry a little bit because if i look back on louder's career was hunt his biggest rival probably not but he, i mean he was that season but it, there was a seriousness and a bluntness to louder he's the same now nicky louder is like non-executive chairman or something at mercedes so he'll be interviewed after races, Mercedes being one of the teams in Formula One. And he'll be interviewed after races, and he's always really blunt. You know, he's always just basically, if someone's an asshole or he thinks they're an asshole, he'll say they're an asshole. And that comes across in the sort of brawl characterization of him, whereas, like, James Hunt was on one big fucking party through his life. Died at the age of 45 at a heart attack. You know, he lived, he lived life to the full. Well, there's a story of James Hunt. I think, was it in Japan? In one weekend, he shagged 33 women. Cool. One weekend. That's James, that was James Hunt. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's talking about we'll queuing up one next. Day, one day, we'll have they, to were, they, were queuing, doing, um... they were queuing outside his hotel room. God, his dick must have been sore. Up there in the oh. <laughs> He's busy. Getting busy with all those geishas. Um, we'll have to watch it one of these days. Yeah, we can, I don't know what we'd fit that into. Well, not... not that into sport <laughs> films yeah um, I don't I don't I don't know that I particularly want to do a Ron Howard series necessarily but yeah we'll see oh come on far and away come on let's do far and away uh, <laughs> parenthood yeah alright we'll see um, the so dilemma anyway, anyway social media folks uh, not that I'm on it that much but you can find me on Cinematronics on Twitter you can find me at the Pastor Kid 1976 you can find us at Expect Us Talk um, on the Twitter board and Facebook.com. Just type in Expect Us to Talk in the search bar. And you can also find us on iTunes. So if you type in Do You Expect Us to Talk and give us a glowing five star review, it helps us to rank higher in the ratings and attract more lovely listeners. And all well, our listeners are lovely. Um, and yeah, we are all about the internet. So y'all. you can also drop us an email if you'd like to expect us to talk at gmail.com. Cool. But no, you're not having our money. No one's ever. Uh, <laughs> well, I suppose uh, we do get spam. So I suppose we do get spam have, emails from like Nigerian people, princes. People Greetings have to you all. My name is Prince. Blah 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 from fictitious um, country. It's a lot of money. Phone <laughs> <laughs> jacker there. Is uh, your credit card detailed? <laughs> oh, <come on>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're about to come the, to the penultimate in our Quentin Tarantino series and the first in our all the Western series, which means Becca. Do you expect to talk or return with Django Unchained? Django! Django!